start. So welcome to the 28th meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item, remember to switch off your phones. Or, uh, people will be using tablets, etc., because the committee's papers are provided in digital form. Um, we welcome Christian Allard to the meeting as a substitute for Mike Russell. And we received apologies from Claudia Beamish and Mike Russell. And uh, we uh, need to now move to the first item of business on our agenda this morning, which is to take evidence on the Land Reform Scotland Bill. Uh, uh, on Monday, the 14th September, we undertook a fact-finding visit as part of our scrutiny of the bill. Uh, we travelled to Fife, where we visited the Falkland Centre for Stewardship, National Trust for Scotland at Falkland Palace, and the King Corn Community Land Association. The visit allowed us to meet with various community representatives who are actively involved in land ownership and management. And I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to meet us. We learned some key lessons about community participation in land ownership and management during this visit. And these lessons will help inform our scrutiny, scrutiny of the bill and the report that we make. Today, we're taking oral evidence on part two, chapter three and part 10 of the bill. So I'd like to welcome <coughs> the guests in a round table format, uh, Scott Walker, the Chief Executive of uh, uh, NFUS, uh, Christopher Nicholson, Chairman of the STFA, Martin Hall, the President of uh, SAVA, uh, Mike Gascoigne, the Convener of the Rural Affairs Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland, Andrew Howard, Managing Director for Murray Estates, David Johnson, the Chair of uh, Scottish Land and Estates, Neil Milner, uh, Niall Milner, beg your pardon, uh, the uh, Rex Scotland Rural and Geomatics Professional Group Board, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Since you get your full title, good morning to you all. Uh, um, we will be asking you questions around the table. It doesn't require everyone to answer, but if you do, try and make it as short, sharp as possible, as we have a lot to say. Well, first of all, does the panel agree that uh, there are two main objectives for the tenanted sector? First of all, to ensure that land which is currently in tenure can be invested in so that it is farmed productively. And secondly, to enable new tenancy opportunities to be created for new entrants to farming and to allow existing farm farmers to farm more flexibly. If you don't think these are the only two main things, then you might want to say so. So who wants to kick off? Just indicate and I'll bring people in. David Johnson. Start. Um, yes, I think fundamentally from Scottish Land and State's point of view, we support the aims of what you're trying to do, which is what we see is to create a vibrant tenanted sector. And we think that that is vitally important going forward into the future for Scottish farming to allow it to to restructure and be fit and competitive for the 21st century. Um, we're going to be seeing, in five years' time, a cap review, which is probably going to result in less income coming into Scottish farming. So that is where the, the tenanted sector is going to become vital to allow these farms to restructure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add to the question by saying, you know, both of these objectives in this bill need to be satisfied simultaneously. Can they be satisfied simultaneously? And if not, where do you think the overriding public interest lies? Because we're very keen to ensure that, as the bill suggests, that the public interest is the main reason why we're proceeding along the lines that we are. Who wants to come in? Uh, Chris Nicholson and then Scott Walker. Convener, th thank you for the opportunity um, to give evidence to the committee. Um, we, we welcome the general thrust of the, of the bill and, and agree that focus should be on opportunities for new entrants and ensuring continued investment in the, in the tenanted sector. Um, we're aware that there are some, some gaps in the, in, in the bill as far as the, those aims are concerned. And... Um, especially in terms of new, new entrants, we see limited opportunity in that the, the new 
types of leases that are, are being um, promoted in, in the bill, the modern LDTs and the existing L LDTs, are more appropriate for uh, bolt-ons to existing farming businesses rather than to establish um, and, and support standalone farm, fa family farming. Um, we, we believe it's in the public interest to try and ensure that security of tenure is maintained in the sector. At the moment, around 80% around of the agricultural sector, tenanted sector is under security of tenure. And there is some recognition by, by the review group and in the bill that the nature of tenancies have changed a lot um, in, in the last, um, say, 50, 60 years in that the original model of tenancy was for the landlord to provide land and fixed equipment and the tenant provided working capital and Hudsonbury skill and labour. However, that's changed and we now have um, a large number of our members who have been in um, secure tenancies for many generations now with very little landlord investment in fixed equipment since the start of those leases. And we're now in a situation where um, all the modern fixed equipment on many tenanted farms is provided by the tenant. And we feel that there are some gaps in the bill that um, do not fully recognise that and um, do not provide the security necessary for, for tenants to carry on in investing in their, in their farms. And we see it as clearly in the public interest to um, ensure that tenants do invest in the, in the future on their farms. We'll come back to some of the detail of, uh, of that about fixed equipment and so on in due course, but uh, your points about gaps in the bill we will explore just now. So, Scott Walker. Um, thank you. Um, just dealing with the, the general premise, premise just now, I think everyone who's given evidence today will all agree that what we're trying to get is a vibrant, thriving tenant sector. And I think everyone would also agree with the, the two premises that you've, that you've put forward that what we want is, at the end of the time, a bill that encourages greater investment to take place in tenant farms and also uh, opportunities that allow more land to be tenanted in Scotland and therefore provide opportunities for, for new entrants to come into the industry. I think, though, we've got to bear in mind that the bill is only part of the wider picture. So the bill by itself, and, and if Scotland's view cannot deliver all these, all these things, We've got to look at what else you know, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government can, can do. So fundamentally what we need is an agricultural sector where money is made. So whether that's a tenant, owner, occupier or anyone connected, connected with farming, unless he can actually make money at farming you know, to invest in, in the business for new entrants who want to come into agriculture is going to be different. So that's about general rule, rules and regu regulations. But that would be another discussion at another point of time. And, of course, there are tax issues and tax implications, which, again, I think we'll talk about as we get into some of the detail of the bill, which, again, pulls us in, in different, different, different uh, directions. I think, as, as Chris said, there's, there's certainly some aspects uh, that we think need to be added to the bill that currently aren't there, which, again, we'll talk in, in detail. But I think WAGO, for instance, is one of these things where there's perhaps a consensus forming of something that can be done that would be of benefit to existing tenants, encourage them to invest, and also give greater encouragement for new entrants to come into the industry. Uh, David Johnston, I'll give you a chance to come back just now because I added to the question then Andrew Howard. Um, I think you've, the question you've raised about the confidence is one of the key issues that uh, we see within this bill. Um, the public interest is in creating a vibrant tenanted sector, and within this bill there are, there are two different um, parts to it from our point of view. You have the, the changes to the 91 Act style tenancies and the creation of the modern limited duration tenancy. Um, and what landowners are looking for from using the new vehicles going forward in the future is confidence that the agreements they're going to enter into for a long period of time, because we believe in fundamental letting for a long period of time, are going to be honoured and respected. So this is what the MLDT is going forward into the future. The problem we have with some of the measures that are proposed here is that they are retrospective amendments to what has happened previously to previous agreements. And that sends out a message that um, there are concerns that the agreements that we're going to be entered into, why would they be honoured? Why are they not going to be retrospectively changed, like some of the proposals are to 91 attendance? So if we're going to encourage people 
to let more land into the future. It has to come from this 70% who are the owner occupiers around the country, and they need the confidence that their, their agreement will be honoured going forward into the future. Well, I'm sure that's so, but uh, I'll be asking other people about, you know, why there's, there's some lack of confidence, you know, to add to what, uh, uh, you know, I've asked before since you brought in the question of confidence, and uh, we might sort of explore that a little further, but why? Uh, especially since the rights of tenants have been eroded considerably since the late 1940s in terms of uh, their power to bequeath and to assign, and uh, the confidence for the tenants are such that uh, there's issues there about their ability to uh, actually contribute to this bipartite uh, activity of land ownership and tenancy. So, you know, we are aware of your concerns about confidence, but there may be other views on that which people can express. Andrew uh, Howard first. Thank you, convener. Um, do I need to press this? No. No. Um, fully automated this parliament, <laughs> unlike Westminster. <laughs> Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that there, there is investment from landlords, as there is from um, tenants. I think it would be slightly unfair to characterise the, um, the system as being one where tenants provide virtually all the fixed equipment as well, because I don't think that would um, be correct. But going forward, what's essential is to have a framework that's attractive for both parties to invest. You can't just focus on um, encouraging investment from tenants. You need to have an um, agricultural holdings framework that um, means that the landlord is willingly engaging in that process as well and feels um, confident and um, happy to invest alongside the investments that the tenants are making. Okay. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. I, th I thought Scott Walker made a really good point because I've always felt that the um, a, a measure of success of any land reform bill, any agricultural holdings legislation, would be to see an increase in the amount of land coming onto the let market. Uh, and I have a very simple question. Is, is do, do people on the panel think that this bill is likely to lead to that outcome? Uh, well, we'll take Andrew Howard to follow on and then David Johnson to follow up that. Um, to be succinct, no. Would you like me to expand? <laughs> well, that's, that's fine. David Johnson, are you... So Not as quite as succinct as Andrew is here. I think there's a potential within this bill, um, depending on the measures that are brought in. There's a huge amount within here that's um, sort of reserved and coming along later, and the details are to be clarified. There is the potential to provide the opportunity to create that confidence, but there is also the potential to go completely in the other direction, and it is quite delicately balanced at the moment as to which way it's going to go. This, uh, Nicholson. In, in terms of um, the area of let land in Scotland, if you look at the statistics that the um, Scottish Government have, have provided, um, the biggest drop in, in t tenanted area results from um, loss of um, tenancies in the secure tenanted sector, which make up um, around about 80% of the um, sector. And the measures in this bill in terms of um, making family succession um, slightly wider and simplifying the family succession process should ensure that more of those tenancies remain tenanted in, in the future. That's so not, that, that's not an increase in the amount of land coming But it will, it will reduce the current decrease. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, when you're discussing the public interest from the both the, the tenant and the landlord, surely the issue is about the, the way in which the land is used to produce food, uh, to produce other uh, public goods, and that, uh, in fact, the purpose of the bill is to ensure that that happens better. And the tenancy part of it uh, is one of the ways to try and help that to happen. So the responsibilities of landlords in the process of this country being able to feed itself is one of the public interests that none of you have touched upon. Andrew Howard? A, a tenancy is one option that you have as a sort of structure for the farming of land where the party who owns the land doesn't necessarily want to farm it himself. And there are others, contract farming agreements, share farming agreements, um, would be examples. 
So if the land isn't in a tenancy, I don't think that necessarily means that it's not being farmed productively and delivering the other public policy objectives that the government has set out. I think what the bill needs to aspire to do is to ensure that um, the agricultural holdings framework is seen as a perfectly viable and attractive option for somebody who doesn't wish to farm them, the land themselves at that time, whether they be a large landowner or, an, or currently an owner-occupied farmer. Um, and at the moment, I think that the option of creating a tenancy, even if in, in all other circumstances it might suit that individual, isn't being taken up and other structures such as contract farming or share farming are being used because of concerns over, frankly, the politicisation of um, the agricultural holdings system. Well, it's the politicisation of the agricultural holding system to suggest that contract farming is something which we should look at, and it's been rejected uh, as an approach in Scotland. And uh, therefore, I think we should recognise that, you know, we can use the word politicisation in lots of different ways, and we should be careful about how we do it. We've been trying to find a way through this maze. We're trying not to be uh, too partisan one way or another in our language, but the word political is something which is quite partisan, I can assure you. We are aware of uh, what's being said. Um, Martin Hall. Well, if I could answer Alec Ferguson's question, I think the answer is, um, I think it, the bill, as it's proposed, protects existing agricultural tenants. Um, and will it increase the amount of new land coming on the market? I don't think it will. So I think it protects, but I don't think it increases the, the um, sector. Okay. And uh, we've got Scott Walker and then Chris Nicholson. I'm optimistic. You know, we're at, we're at the start of this bill, bill process. There's been a lot of work gone on, on before it. And I think what we're all trying to aim to get here is, I'll go back to my point, we want more tenanted land in Scotland. We want greater investment in that ten, tenanted land in, in Scotland. And from NFE Scotland's point of view, we are very partisan. We want more food produced in Scotland and for that food to be produced profitably for those that, that produce it. So I, I start off with this process in saying that We've got an opportunity here, and it's up to everyone giving evidence here today to hopefully push the Parliament, as I would describe it, in the right direction of things that we feel need to be added to the bill that isn't there just now, and also to encourage you in areas where we think the bill maybe is lacking or needs a little bit of, bit of direction. But there's a lot of people out there who've been asking for a long time you know, to look at the current situation because the current situation, for whatever reason, hasn't been working satisfactory to all parties uh, involved. And it's important that at the end of the process, we do have something that is satisfactory to all parties because if it works for everyone, then we are going to get a situation where it encourages people to, one, want to rent land and, two, want to be the rentee of, of that, that land. So I'm optimistic. And Christopher Nicholson. Um, the review group's report um, hi highlighted um, other difficulties or obstacles to the letting of land, um, which I think are very significant in, in driving current landlord behaviour. Um, the main two points being um, the, the, the way the, the present common agricultural policy works in terms of subsidies and also the current fiscal um, policy, which makes it more attractive um, for landlords not to let land but to use vehicles such as contract farming of, of farming in hand and I think until those two topics are addressed it's going to be very difficult to um, encourage uptake of, of new style t tenancies. Okay I think we've got a start in this just now let's get dig into some of the details. So, Tenant Farming Commissioner Jim Hume. Panel, thanks for coming along. Um, yes, yeah, so the, there's a proposal from the Scottish Government regarding having a, a single tenant farming commissioner. He would be a, a member of the, the Scottish Land Commission, but not a land commissioner. Um, just generally, uh, I would be interested to hear the panel's views on those proposals and perhaps some of the, their views on what they would like to see out of a tenant farmer's uh, commissioner and, and perhaps even commission.
Um, we, we've always been very supportive of the idea of having a commissioner. It has been talked about in different uh, names and different formats of, over the years. But we see this as a, a hugely important role to make sure that the bill operates correctly and also that we get to, to a better environment, an operating in, environment. It's important that the, the Commissioner is going to be proactive in our, in our view in, in the area. So the Commissioner is looking already at different codes, different statutes, different best practice is that operate, operate within, within the sector and needs to actively pro, pro, promote and, I would say, police those, those practices to see that they're, they're adhered to. We also feel that the Commissioner has got to have adequate power so they can intervene and can, can take action. I know that has been suggested that where does, does the role of the Scottish Land Court start and stop and where does the roles of the, the Commissioner start and, start and stop? And there's a uh, you know, fear of, of overlapping um, occur. From our point of view and speaking to our members across, across the country, I think everyone wants to avoid going to court wherever possible. You know, it's, it's a costly process. And often the process that ends up, even if there is a good relationship, you could break down that relationship between a tenant and a landlord you know, to the disadvantage in, in the future. Whereas if you have an active commissioner who could actually intervene, who could rule on certain points and could you know, encourage the parties to, to reach, reach agreement, I think that would, would all be, be seen, seen as beneficial. So one of, the, one of the issues I would raise at this stage is to ensure that the resources and the funds available to the commissioner are adequate so that they can take, in, take, take account of being an active role with, within, within the sector. Who Somebody else want to come in? Just, just, just indicate. Niall. Oh, yes, I, I think it's very important that the Commissioner is a independent and relatively impartial appointment. I think we'll need to make sure the selection process is robust to ensure that you know, the person that does that job can be as fair as possible with, with both parties. I think that's, that's very important. Thank you. David Johnson? Yeah. Um, I think, well, from Scottish Landless' point of view, we support the introduction of the Tent Farming Commissioner. Um, we think it's a good thing. We think the Interim Commissioner has hit the ground running and is working together to provide good practice and guidance uh, to help the industry better avoid these disputes. Uh, we think that within the, the bill itself, the balance of the rights and responsibilities of the Commissioner versus that of the Land Court have been got just about right. We think the final arbiter should be the land court for anything to do with legal disputes, um, but that the interim commissioner should be able to um, provide the guidance which the land court is able to take cognizance of when it's passing a judgment. So the balance is about right. Okay. Anyone else want to answer? Chris Nicholson. Uh, uh, STFA are very supportive of the establishment of a, the tenant farming commissioner. Um, much of his role has been um, is, is, is quite clear now and has been debated. There's one area where we think, in common with others, that, that some more thought could go into it, which is the tenant the tenant commissioner's role in in dispute resolution. Um, in I think Rick's mentioned in their submission that the land court should be the last resort and there should be um, um, arbitration or expert determination encouraged prior to the land court. And we see the tenant farming commissioner as, as having a, a potential role in that and a bridge between um, pr prior to the land court. David, yes. Support for mediation and arbitration is far better than going to the land court. Okay, uh, so we may well look at some of that. Any more you want to yeah, pick up? Yeah, just to Chip? follow up, it's all quite interesting. I just, just wondered if you know, there's, there should be a formal, um, if any of the uh, members here today agree that there should perhaps be a, a formal link between the Scottish Land Commission and the Tenant Farmers Commission, perhaps the Tenant Farmer Commissioner actually being on the Land Commission. Um, I wonder if that would be of interest at all to anyone. I want to comment on that, Christopher Nicholson. Um, we, we, we think it's very sensible that the Tenant Farming Commissioner is a member of the Scottish Land Commission. We feel that you can't look at tenancies in isolation from the rest of land reform issues. Uh, um, and if there's nobody else on that, the, the other point I had yes. was uh, really just on the accountability. I think Neil Milner mentioned about uh, the Commissioner being independent, but. 
uh, just wonder what form of uh, accountability uh, you would therefore think would be appropriate. In who he answers to? Yes, or she or she answers to? Yeah. Well, ult ultimately, it would be the government that appoints him um, or her, but I suppose also it, it should potentially be some of the groups here today who represent the industry as a whole. That's really what I was looking for. I yeah. just wonder if there was a mechanism that some of the members here thought would be appropriate. Well, I mean, at the moment you have the interim commissioner where, where the, the three bodies, the NFUS, SLE and STFA, are sitting working with him to do that. And I would see whether the um, tenant farming commissioner, that's much the same, would be a good way of going forward into the future. Mm -hmm. And as for the independence, ensuring that it is independent, seen to be independent, is what gives it its credibility going forward into the future. And that's something that the government itself can, can sort out. OK. Thanks. So therefore, you know, should the, uh, do you all agree with the STFA that the commissioner should have powers to enforce codes of good practice? Because that would certainly be the way in which uh, his or her independence would... Uh, be measured. Scott Walker? Yeah, and then David. Yeah, we, we, we've debated this and looked, looked at this for, for a long time. And we think it's important that you know, once you actually have a code of practice, those codes of practice has, has to be adhered here to. Now, it comes down to how do you actually enforce it. If you have an independent commissioner, that would seem to us to be an appropriate way of ensuring that those codes are, are, in, are enforced. And then you get on to the, the role of sanctions. So what are the actual sanctions when those codes aren't enforced? And I think that's when you've got to look at sort of a, a progressive list of sanctions. So in the, in the first instance, it's almost like giving people a yellow card to say, you've not adhered to it, you've got a time frame to adhere, adhere to it. That would be your first stage. And then thereafter, you escalate up, upwards. And uh, Andrew Howard. David Johnson. Um, um, from a, a statutory code of practice, we, we don't think that the codes of practice should be statutory. We think they should be there for the, to encourage the best practice. Um, but then if you're going to end up in the land court where you've got the legal statutory framework, if you haven't followed those codes of good practice, that forms part of the judgment that the land court takes into account, just the way you've behaved. So in effect, it gives the same. Uh, yeah, I understand that. Uh, Andrew Howard? I mean, David's made the point, really. I think you, you're at risk of blurring the edges between a, um, a, a legal and judicial process and one which is about guiding the parties to do the, the right thing. And I think we'd sort of have to understand how you would prevent that blurring from being messy. <coughs> Dave Thompson. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Um, I've had a fair bit of experience myself in my past in relation to codes of practice through trading standards, consumer protection and so on. And... Uh, my experience tells me that if you have a purely voluntary code of practice, even one that a court can take into account at a later date, then the good people follow it and the crooks ignore it, the bad people ignore it. And that's been shown to be the case, you know, in many different spheres. So maybe uh, as a halfway house, we've mentioned arbitration and mediation, and everyone seems to be in agreement about that. If um, the status of the codes of practice could be built in to be something that in a mediation process would carry almost a statutory position as opposed to being statutory in a legal sense, but if we could get a form of words that would allow us to embed them into the mediation and arbitration process, would members of the panel feel that might be a good halfway house? about his previous job when he was mentioning the word yeah. crooks. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, I was indeed, yes. <laughs> Martin. No. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you raise a good point there, um, I th but I think the way to do it would be to bring the, to give the land court powers to be able to appoint arbitrators, mediators, or, or whatever, or, or, or independent experts, and I think that would be the, the way to bring that in, and I think, I think that would work. Is, is, is there, sorry, convener, I'm just coming back. Is there not a danger, though, that I think the point that David Johnson was making about the statutory nature of the codes, that the land court would take them into account. If you build it into a legal process, legal processes by their very nature can be very lengthy, time-consuming and expensive. 
if you build it into a mediation arbitration process and not, you know, uh, then it's possible that that might be a much more efficient, quicker way, but it would give them legal status. Um, I mean, you could give it legal status in the mediation process and the legal process, but I wouldn't want it just to be left, you know, um, to the end of the line. It needs to be brought in at an earlier stage. I, I, if I could come back, yeah. I, well, I think that opportunity is, it should, should always be there to be able to refer. So if, if it is perhaps brought in as part of the code, but, but th uh, where I was coming from is even if, it, if it's ignored at that stage and you end up at the legal process, then it shouldn't just end up at the land court. The, the land court should be able to, to get a quick resolution to it, and if it's, not, if it's proportionate to the dispute in hand, refer it in and, and, and a practical nature, then refer it to arbitration or to mediation to get it resolved rather than having to go through the lengthy and expensive process that the land court is. So it's really a, a second backstop almost, that, but a quicker way of getting it resolved and, a, and, and cheaper as well. I think this might come up uh, as we go along. Um, I was just going to ask uh, Niall if he thinks that uh, land agents should be uh, part of this process where uh, uh, the commissioner would have power to enforce codes of pr good practice. Absolutely. Um, our members act, you know, representing tenants, representing landlords, also, you know, sometimes managing the properties in hand as well. So we are involved in it at, at, at every stage of the, of, of the process and stages through the industry. So, yeah, we'd be absolutely welcome being part of that. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'd like to move on to MLDT's uh, Angus MacDonald has a question. Um, as we know, um, the objective of the MLDT is to replace LDTs with a more appropriate uh, balance of obligations and discretions on the parties than the current LDT allows. Um, now, we've heard from SLE who have stated uh, that the differences between current LDTs and the proposed MLDTs appear minimal. Uh, and they go on to, to state that it's a missed opportunity to develop a truly modern vehicle. And we've also heard from the STFA, who state that it provides uh, few tangible changes. So I'd be interested to hear what the panel's uh, views are on the proposed MLDTs, and are you all satisfied with the Scottish Government's explanation uh, of the differences between LDTs and MLDTs? Um, yes, you're, you're right in that we see few tangible differences. Um, we have some concerns about um, calls for more flexibility, uh, which would result in um, us going down the, the road that we see in England developing over the last 20 years, where um, the average length of a farm business tenancy now in, in England is, is around, as far as I know, is around three and a half years. Now, that's, I don't believe, is in the public interest for the long-term maintenance of land and farm, farm infrastructure. Um, there is one recommendation of the review group concerning LDTs or MLDTs that has not been brought forward, which was the recommendation for a 35-year repairing le lease for land that is, um, require, requires improvement. And we saw that as one opportunity, genuine opportunity for, for new entrants. And that's not in this bill. I, I don't know whether there's intention to bring it forward at a later stage. But in terms of creating opportunity for new entrants, that's one, one measure that's been recommendation from the review group that's been missed, missed out. We don't know about that, but we will ask that question. Scott Walker. Uh, just starting off by supporting what Chris says with regards to the repairing lease. Uh, we were very supportive of that idea of the repairing lease and think that that could be a, a useful vehicle uh, to encourage new people in, in, into farming and also to encourage uh, some land to be let that otherwise wouldn't have, have been let. So we'd like to see that come, come forward as an amendment. Um, I think the problem with, well, not a problem, sorry. The, the issue with MLDTs is it's not substantially different to what we, we currently have in terms of the SLDT and LDTs. Fundamentally the same, same vehicle. And the issue for us comes back to partly what we've discussed before about confidence and getting people to, to let land for a longer period of, of time. 
you know, as a rough rule of thumb, and this is a very rough rule, rule of thumb, if you're doing crop and land, you can survive with a shorter lease period. If you've got livestock, then you need a longer lease, lease, lease period as a, as a gen, general, general rule. And I think what we're trying to get away from um, is that the current system sort of encourages by its nature shorter term leases to, to be given. And what we're hoping to create through the whole auspices of this bill and MLDTs is a system that would encourage people to give longer leases, you know, particularly in livestock <coughs> sort of situations where that's necessary for for the nature nature of nature of farming. Um, so the basic MLDT MLDT proposal is fine as it stands. Be good to get this um, repair and lease incorporated in, in, into, into it. Andrew Howard. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, I concur with, the, uh, with Chris and Scott that there's not <clears throat> um, substantive differences. The uh, increased flexibility over um, uh, fixed equipment responsibility, I think, is welcome because it probably recognises the um, diverse uh, use of um, LDTs and now um, probably MLDTs in that some are additional blocks of land to units that have already got um, infrastructure and therefore you don't need to um, uh, provide um, above ground fixed equipment as it were. Um, you, you mentioned the point of flexibility. One of the challenges that we face in framing um, an agreement for a farm now is that there's a greater number of farms have got farm diversifications, other businesses that are being run on that farm, which don't really fall into the um, realm of agricultural activity or they're an adjunct to agricultural activity. And the way in which the parties might agree as to how that diversification is undertaken and how the rewards might be split from that diversification don't always sit well with the framework of an agricultural lease. Now, what's going on at the moment is that um, usually that enterprise is taken out of the agricultural lease and a separate commercial lease will be agreed for that. Um, um, this might have represented an opportunity to provide flexibility that would have allowed that just to be en encompassed within one agreement. It's not always easy. Sometimes the two things don't sit that well together, but I think that's probably what um, was referred to in terms of the opportunity to get flexibility into new lease structures. David? Yeah, I mean, we agree pretty much with everything that's been said so far. Um, we think it's, from an SLE's point of view, it is a slightly missed opportunity to allow this, this flexibility that Andrew's talking about, because as we're seeing the changes, people are thinking of doing stuff that we haven't even dreamed of, and we need to give, uh, allow the flexibility to do that. Uh, I think the the rollover point where it goes from 10 years and rolls automatically into another 10 years, I think, is a missed opportunity as well. Uh, what we have at the moment where it goes from 10 to 3 to 3 and then back to 10, I think, is accepted and people are reasonably comfortable with it. So we see the reason why that needs to be changed. Um, when originally it came out, the SLDTs, the, the period between 0 and 10 years, had gone. Now the SLDTs are standing back in. So uh, there's a break clause at 5 years, which probably won't... <laughs> amount to much. Most people use the SLDTs if they want to do that. Um, a greater flexibility would encourage more people to let. Alec Ferguson. I just, I just to ask Chris Nicholson if he could, where he got the figure of three and a half years for the average length of tenancy down south, because I think we had evidence <laughs> previously on the committee that suggested it was actually in excess of double that length of time. I think it, it may be higher where... Um, entire holdings are let on, on, an, on an FBT, but many FBTs are just for small blocks of land that are bolt-ons to bigger holdings. So my, my evidence came from, would have come from the English TFA. Okay, thanks. I think, I think where it's talking about um, whole livestock units being let, I think it's near nine to ten years is, is the initial term for a farm business tenancy. Okay, I just which, wanted to... Which mirrors our MLDT. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank okay. you. Okay, we... Can check that out, I guess. Anything else, Angus? No? Okay. In that case, we'll move on to the conversion from 1991 tenancies. Alec Ferguson? You can be a yes. And I, I have to say, I'm a fan of um, trying to bring a bit of flexibility with, within this whole sector. And I, and I see conversion as being a, a, a means of doing that. Um, as I'm sure everybody's aware, the original recommendation of the view group was that um, there should be an ability to convert 
to a 35-year lease, which could be assigned for value, the bill is actually introducing um, the potential of converting uh, a 91 Act tenancy to an MLDT, but gives the Minister a power to determine the length of that limited duration tenancy, as I understand it. Now, in, in, in its submission, the NFUS specifically raised concerns uh, uh, over legal uncertainties, which was what it referred to. And I just wondered if, to start this conversation, whether it, the NFUS could expand a little bit on those perceived uncertainties, whether you feel that some clarity has been achieved, and or whether you still have concerns over that element of the proposal. Um, this has been an area where it's generated a lot of debate within our membership um, across, across the country. And what we saw from uh, the government bringing forward the bill was some clarity on the parameters to be discussed. Because there's no point in discussing potential outcomes that wouldn't possibly make themselves make their, their way into the bill because of potential uh, compliance with uh, European hu human rights. Now, what I mean by that is that for some of our members, they would like to see a conversion of a secure tenancy to a secure tenancy to be passed on to, 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 to others. For others, it's conversion of a secure tenancy to a fixed term tenancy and what should be that length of that fixed, fixed term tenancy. Now, in discussions that, that we've had with uh, sort of the bill team, it's certainly been flagged up to, to us that there's an issue uh, still to be resolved as to what could actually be done that would be uh, deemed within the powers of, of the Parliament and therefore not be challengeable within, within law. So we, we felt it inappropriate to come to you know, a definite solution uh, on, on this, this one, given that whatever we may or may not like may not be possible to come, come fo forward with. So we think it would be useful if the government could actually set out the parameters once those parameters have been established by the government, then whether it be NFUS or other organisations, I'm sure we could then go to other lawyers and sort of say, well, what is possible or not, not possible? Because at this moment in time, when we ask people, they, they basically say a huge range of stuff, but it's very grey. So if I may follow that up, um, what you're saying is you'd prefer to see more detail at this stage rather than leaving it to secondary legislation? Yes, we'd, we'd like to see more detail uh, at this stage so we could have an informed discussion, debate, debate on the subject. The basic principle, though, if I go just deal with the basic principle from an FUS's point, point of view, we, we've saw that we go back to what we, we saw as a perceived problem. perceived problem was that there were some tenants sitting with the tenancy who didn't have somebody to inherit their, their, their tenancy, and therefore they would continue in that tenancy for longer than is in their interest as an individual, for longer than is in the interest of, of the landowner, and for longer than we believe is the interest of Scottish agriculture, because it, it wouldn't be as productive as some, somebody else, else would be. Therefore, to, to give some form of vehicle that would allow um, that, that individual to pass on and sell that te tenancy, we believed would be, be use, useful. So that's where we came from originally, and why originally we talked about a 25-year length of term, which then the Ag Holdings Review Group uh, suggested being a 35-year year term. Convener, can I open this out to the rest of the, the, the witnesses to just to get their views on this aspect? I share Scott's view that the principle of what's being proposed um, could achieve the objective that I think the government um, wishes to achieve, which is to encourage retirement. Um, I think it would have been really important to see the detail of this in the bill because it's a big step. I mean, this is effectively allowing the, trans uh, the, uh, the change and sale of a tenancy, which is not something that's been previously permitted other than in a limited duration. Um, uh, vehicles, so that would have been very helpful. I, I think it's also it would also be helpful to understand what motivates tenants who are sitting where they are. Sometimes it might be need because they can't afford to retire, in which case this is helpful. Sometimes it might be their tax status, so they're sitting there on a favourable trading tax status as a as a tenant. So there may be little incentive to give up that status at that point. Um, and it could also be that the housing and lifestyle that's being provided by the, the 
the farm is is better than it would be elsewhere. So it's always important, I think, to understand what is motivating people if you're going to design a policy that um, uh, achieves it. But if the balance is got right, um, then I think this might achieve its aim. Now, when I say balance, this has to be something that provides something for um, the outgoing tenant. It needs to be sensible and affordable for the incoming tenant, particularly if you want to encourage younger and new entrants to do that, because the longer the term and the, the more sort of without restriction the policy is, then it's highly unlikely that they'll be able to compete with larger established farmers who will simply outbid them. Um, and uh, the, the land out, the landlord, um, probably needs to see something out of this as well. And the obvious advantage to them is that they've, they've seen a conversion from um, uh, a tenancy vehicle where they have no certainty over the end of that tenancy vehicle to one which has a defined term. Um, and now, I would suggest that making that, the period of that term too long is likely to lead to more owners interjecting and buying out at that stage, which isn't going to achieve the objective of opening up um, tenancy operations, uh, opportunities, sorry. And, and it is probably going to increase the risk that somebody feels that it's contravened their rights and therefore they might feel that they want to challenge um, the policy. So I think the principle is probably very helpful, but getting the balance right will be important to whether it works or whether it's actually almost <coughs> counterproductive. Helpful. Um, d d during the course of the review group's work, uh, assignation for value outside family members was a, was a key part of the debate. And if you remember back to the um, time last year when, when the review group produced their interim report, in that interim report was the discussion of the op giving tenants the opportunity to assign their lease as, to continue as a secure as a secure tenancy. So the assignation provisions have been steadily watered down from the interim report to the final report, and now there's uncertainty as to whether the 35-year conversion is, is, is possible. And as this has happened, it is, to our mind, leaving real gaps in, in the bill um, that assignation was meant to address. Um, some people have covered them, but one of the key gaps is, is Wago. Um, we're not now in a, s a situation where, where many tenancies have tenant investment going back um, almost a century, and the, in some cases half the value of the holding, open market value of the holding, is, is down to tenants' improvements, and there needs to be a way, a fair way, of tenants realising their property right in their lease and their improvements. And open assignation was one method of, of doing that. Now, with the long-term nature of uh, um, investment in holdings and the duration of farm improvements, um, anything less than 35 years is unlikely to allow a tenant with significant improvements um, fair value for his improvements. So th this uncertainty over where assignation is going is cause for, for concern because as it's been watered down, it leaves gaps that need addressing from other other angles. Um, Alec Ferguson, to point, follow up that point. I mean, we are, we are coming to assignation and succession sort yeah. of later on, and, and because we're, I'm really talking... Yeah, I was referring talking... to non-family. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 sorry, right, okay, sorry, understood. Yeah, yeah. David yeah. Uh, yeah. Johnson. And then... Convener. Um, I think uh, Scott and Andrew, uh, I highlighted the, the problems with tenants trying to come out of the farms, uh, and Chris touched on a very important issue within this, which is, is waygoing. And it seems that the core issue within this is trying to establish a fair waygoing for the tenants coming out. That's the problem that's seeking to be addressed with regards to assignation. So from that point of view, sort the problem out by dealing with waygoings. Don't expand it into other, other areas. Um, from Scottish Land and Estates' point of view, we would love to see more detail on the conversion at the moment. At the moment, it's, it's very light, and uh, it is quite difficult to make a, a detailed judgment call as to how it would work in practice, because we don't have those details yet. Um, but we can see the principle of what it's trying to do, which is encourage the churn within the sector. Uh, and we can see merits in, in what it's trying to achieve. Um, the term, as has been alluded to, is very uh, key to within this. Um, 
if you have a, a longer term, obviously it's more risk to be being challenged. The shorter term, the, the less risk, but it's allowing the right term to, to strike the balances. Um, we already have the principle that an MLDT should be for a minimum of 10 years. Um, there's something in there to guide us in the direction perhaps of where we should be looking to go. Um, this also cannot be looked in the isolation away from succession assignation as well. The two of them go hand in hand. And if... Detail. Yeah. We've got that. Uh, Martin and then Dave I, Thompson. Thank you. I just wanted to support Christopher's point, actually, is it, it's because it's a gap that's in the current legislation, is, the, is how to deal with WIGO in, your, in conversion from an existing full tenancy to, a, to an LDT, and the same gap is there in this proposal, and we need to address that. It's absolutely fundamental if, if this conversion is to happen. Um, and uh, Dave Thompson? Thanks very much, convener. Um, I want to touch later on uh, on the broader issue of assignations and so on, but I was intrigued by something that Andrew uh, said when uh, earlier on he was saying that one of the advantages for a, a landlord, a landowner, uh, in conversion is that it gives them, at the moment, um, before conversion, there'd be no certainty of end of tenancy, I think is the phrase he used. And I just wonder if Andrew might want to comment, or anyone else for that matter, on whether ending tenancies uh, is desirable and is it an objective uh, that uh, landlords aspire to? Because if it's a desirable thing in terms of conversion, is it desirable in the broader sense? Um, <clears throat> well, the, one of the difficulties for um, a landlord of the current secure tenancies is that they are, as long as the tenant continues to have an eligible successor or assignee, um, that the landlord has lost control over when the end of the term will be. I mean, in a lease, you, one of the fundamental tenets of a lease is usually that it's for a term, and you know what that term is in a period of years. But with an agricultural tenancy, um, that has been broken down, and it just keeps going and going. Um, and of course, the landlord is unable to manage their affairs in the way that they would with any other tenancy because they can't plan to a certain date. You don't know when it is. Um, and I think the fact that nobody offers any secure tenancies anymore and hasn't done for a long period of time is probably a clear indication of what the, the marketplace, if you like, the people who might offer land for tenancies think of the idea of granting um, a secure tenancy. I'm not in any way suggesting that we should try and construct something that um, starts to whittle away at those um, secure tenancies against the wish of the um, tenant. I mean, one of the um, uh, positives of the conversion route is that the tenant makes that call effectively. They, they make a decision that they want to sort of um, uh, terminate the tenancy and receive a payment of money because somebody's coming in and buying the new vehicle that's been created on the back of it. Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick follow-up, convener, if that's all right. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, there that, that, that the landlord would, has kind of lost control, I think, is the phrase that you, you used. Um, why is that a problem, though? Because if you know you've got a secure tenant, you can plan into the future on the basis you've got a secure tenant, you're getting a fair rent, that's your income, you know where you stand. Exactly the same argument would apply to the 1886 Crofters situation. So why is it a problem? Why do you want to get that control unless you want to change what is happening there, unless you want to um, have your own way totally? When you have certainty because you know what your rent's going to be into the future forevermore. Um, well, the owners... Circumstances may have changed. They may wish at some point to farm it themselves. They may wish to add it to their existing farming business. They may wish to restructure the holdings that they've got on the rest of the estate because individual units might, in current terms, be too small. Um, uh, the landlord having a responsibility um, uh, to maintain that fixed equipment, but it might be on a unit that um, uh, really doesn't make economic sense going forward to continue to plough investment into that when it might be better conjoined to another, um, another unit. So it's, it's, it's inflexibility in reacting to um, circumstances as they go forward because you've just locked everything um, in at that position. I, I, it is worth saying that for a number of farms, 
um, and we've, you know, the bulk of our farms are secure tenancies. It's a very comfortable relationship in a number of cases. Um, it's, it's fine, but there are other areas where you might over time see that you could um, reorganize the, the nature and the structure of the farms to be more effective and at the, at the wide scale might be more effective for Scottish agriculture, but that isn't an ability that you have any control over. Uh, to pick up on this point, um, and how it also relates to, I mean, spoiling everything that Andrew says, and how it relates into the wider confidence within the bill, having um, a conversion from a 91 Act to a, a fixed-term tenancy vehicle um, has the confidence of giving out to landowners that, that, they, that when they enter into an MLDT of a agreed length of time, whether it's five, 10, 15, 20 years or more, that that will in itself then be honoured. So, it, so the conversion itself here has the chance of, of increasing the confidence in using the new vehicles going forward into the future. Going the other way has the risk of doing exactly undermining confidence. And just to, to say that this is not looking at existing 91 tenancies or changing them in any shape or form, because that is for a tenant to decide if they choose to convert or not. Just one final point, Dick, and come on. just to follow that up. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can understand what you're saying there, David. Uh, but the, the broader point would appear to me to indicate that um, some landlords, uh, maybe all, would like to roll things right back to pr uh, prior to 1948 when, when secure tenancies were created. Um, is that something that people would like to see, that they're ultimately all tenancies would be converted to MLDTs and you wouldn't have any tenancies and then landlords yeah. would have full control uh, no, over no, everything. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about altering the existing 91 Act tenancies. At all. Uh, they're, 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 they're in place mm -hmm. and it's for the tenant to decide whether they wish to convert mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. ha have a notice to quit or but whatever the, else. The, the, the point about control that Andrew made and some of the other things... Um, indicates to me that there's a desire and an objective that would like to go back no. to the pre-48 situation. No, there's an acceptance that we are in the situation where we are in, and we have very good relationships with 91 tenancies going forward into the future. This is about trying to create the right set of principles, the right set of the environment, to encourage more land to come into the market going forward in the future, and also to encourage the churn uh, away from fixed-term um, never-ending tenancies into the more flexible nature that's fit for, for Scottish agriculture going forward into the future. Just before we continue this, I think we've got to that point in the conversation where the point is made on both sides. Uh, Alec Ferguson, uh, you wanted to finish off... This. Just to round up this section... Sorry, did somebody else want to come in no, before no, that? You, you, you. You it, round it, up. It, 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 I mean, I think we, we, there's clearly more discussion to be had around this part of the bill, and, and I think we hear the call that most parties would like to, to see more detail um, at this stage of the legislation. But if we are talking about flexibility, uh, and it is my belief that flexibility will help to bring about and restore the confidence that, that I think everybody would agree has been lost um, to a large degree, um, then it would seem to me that if... Uh, a reasonable degree of security is given to a tenant who chooses to convert and assign that conversion. Um, I think that what I'm coming to is I think something David Johnson hinted at, uh, maybe he could clarify it, which is that if uh, a 10-year period is deemed to be suitable for a, a modern limited duration tenancy, is there not a logic in saying it should also be suitable for a conversion to a modern LDT? A min minimum period. Well, Minimum. David Johnson and then Niall Milner and Christopher Nicholson. I mean, there is a consistency then within the legislation, the way it's proposed. Um, we've done a little bit of uh, background work on how you would try and value uh, a hypothetical tenancy for, for conversion. And what we found is that there is an increase in the value to an incoming tenant as you go from 10 years to 15 years. But when you start going out further than that, um, there isn't necessarily an increase that, that an incoming tenant would be prepared to pay to an outgoing tenant. It's done on a discounted cash flow basis. But there is a risk that the longer you go, the more you start to infringe um, the property rights of the, of, of the landlord. It starts to strike an unfair balance. Uh, and so the key to this is trying to find the bit in the middle 
that is um, suitable for both parties and fair for both parties. So, uh, first of all, Niall. Sure, just coming back to the issue of why a fixed term might be desirable, it provides a natural point for review between both parties. Um, I have examples where SLDTs have become 15-year LDTs, um, which has been a 20-year term in total because everyone's quite happy with how everyone's getting on. So fixed term allows people to sit together and actually decide what's the next step for that business. It might be to add more land for the next 10-year round or 15-year round or whatever's agreed. Um, and the other thing about fixed term is it effectively increases the capital value of the land when you're wanting to secure borrowing against it, which if people are looking to bring money into the sector for investment is actually quite important. That's helpful. Um, and uh, Chris Nicholson? Um, the, the, there is a balance here, <coughs> and, and one of the key considerations is, is that you have to make it attractive for the tenant to go down this route, um, bearing in mind that farm improvements nowadays, modern farm buildings have a life expectancy of 70 years or more. Tenants build houses, cottages, they have a life expectancy of 70, design life of over 70 years. Some of the improvements to land are permanent. Um, it's highly unlikely that a tenant is going to receive fair value for, his improve, for those kind of improvements subject to a lease that's only 35 years in duration. And you only have to go across the border to England to see what the value of a house is subject to a 35-year lease compared to a house on a 70-year lease. Um, if, uh, it, I can't see this being used by tenants if it's less than 35 years, and especially for tenants who have significant levels of improvements, um, because they won't be, nobody will be, be prepared to offer a tenant fair value for his improvements if those improvements are subject to a lease that's less than half the life expectancy of those improvements. Yes. Um, this is where I think this is starting to get a little bit blurred, because what you're talking about is waygoings for improvements. But if my understanding, when you're talking about converting a lease, what you're buying is the ability to carry on a business on that ground. Therefore, the way you're going to value it is based on the profitability of the business you see going on within there. It's not on how many houses or anything else is on there. It's, it's how much can you make profit out of that particular holding. So there's a, there's a blurring of the lines going on here between two, which I think, which I think are different. Well, I, I don't think there is. The, re the reason why tenants... Um, the 1883 Act brought in compensation for improvements for tenants because it was recognised that tenants don't require more than just um, the, the resulting profitability for their improvements... Um, to justify them, they need fair compensation for the capital value of those improvements as well. You can't, a tenant can't justify going out and building a, a grain store purely on, on, uh, on profitability alone. He needs to know that he will receive fair compensation at the end of his lease, and he doesn't know when he will have to give up that lease at some stage. Like, you know, he might have security of tenure, but for all the, the, the tenant... He, he, there may be other circumstances that force the lease to come to an end in 10 years' time or less. A, a com capital compensation for the capital value of improvements is, is vital for t t tenants' um, ability to invest. You're saying we take this on board, OK? Uh, because we obviously have to come to a view ourselves, and we've heard quite a lot from both sides. But, Andrew Howard, to finish it up, which... Uh, Oh, sorry, I thought you'd um, closed it off. But, no, I um, hadn't, but uh, oh, right. between David and uh, Chris, we have just yeah, a moment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think that in, in simple terms, the, the conversion would, um, would have to work by um, effectively taking on um, the terms and the responsibilities um, and uh, um, sort of benefits of the tenancy that was being converted. So, for instance, the improvements that had been carried out by the tenant who was converting to the MLDT, those improvements would carry on into the new tenancy so that the, um, the, the, the landlord of the now MLDT would continue to have a um, compensation liability to the incoming tenant, and the incoming tenant would be able to value that when um, making an assessment of what they were prepared to bid um, to the outgoing tenant. I mean, I think that's the only straightforward legal way that you could do it because it's open and transparent and everybody can make a, a reasoned financial judgment. So the compensation wouldn't disappear anywhere. It would, that um, benefit, if you like, would carry on to the new tenant and they'd have to factor that into their bid. 
Christopher Nicholson. <laughs> Wago, and, and the, this bill at present doesn't address um, changes that we consider necessary to Wago. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Wait, let's let's uh, encapsulate that in that particular argument. Thank you, Alec Ferguson, for not winding it up, but winding it on, yes. <laughs> um, the tenant's right to buy. Uh, Sarah Boyack. Convener, um, and I want to move us on to the issue about the removal of the requirement to register for the preemptive right to buy. Um, so I want to draw those of you in um, just to test out what your views were on it, because the Law Society submission suggests that there might be uncertainties um, and an impact on land sales, um, depending on um, how this actually works. So we want to explore what kind of tenancy tenants have and what impact the removal of the preemptive right to buy will have. So I'm keen to get experience from around the panel. I'm going to ask mine in three bits, convener, so that we can get through all the different issues. I wonder if the Law Society wants to say anything at this point. Um, yes, uh, convener. The, the current arrangement um, has a flexibility there uh, that largely supervised by the keeper of the registers to establish that what is on the register is the whole farm, nothing but the farm, and nothing left out. Um, uh, and, and, and that has worked quite well. Uh, the society is very um, cognizant of the difficulties that some tenant farmers have in reaching up for the pen and applying to have a right to buy in their name. But we don't feel that the just the knocking off of the two issues that appeared in the 2003 Act do the job, to, to be quite frank. It leaves a huge amount of guddle, which can only be resolved ultimately through the land court. David Johnson. We can see what this is trying to accomplish, um, but I think it's going to raise quite a few problems going forward. On a practical side, um, when we see registrations coming through, uh, there's sometimes questions over exactly what type of lease it is, whether it can be registered or not. You get question marks over the area that's in the lease, and you can have disputes while you sort out what was originally in the lease or not. So the very act of the registration in itself helps to clarify um, the arrangement that exists between the landlord and uh, the tenant. And so the process itself is a good thing to see being done. Um, we think that the need to re-register at five years, quite happily to, to do away with that. So once registered, it is always registered. But the process itself, I think, is of very great importance. The other thing that we're having difficulty to understand is that within the review group recommendations, there's also safeguards in there to try and clarify as to what constitutes discussions with developers or outside third parties, and where does the right to buy get triggered or not. Uh, and that's very, very unclear. So at the moment, um, you can you get in a daft situation where people can come to ask you about possibly development on land. You can have a community coming to ask about taking on land on a tentative farm, and you cannot have that discussion. You cannot afford to risk that discussion in case you trigger the right to buy. So that needs to be clarified. There is also the problem, I think, with... Um, if you're going to have this automatically brought in without any registration, there are options in place across the country where people have got with developers already in place. Where do those, where's the conflict get resolved between those? I don't know how you do that. Okay, Sarah, yep. The yep. issue of the retrospective impact on the legislation, I wanted a little bit more from the Law Society on that issue. What I said earlier is basically the answer to your question. This does not help uh, the situation uh, where, as, as others have pointed out, there are options in place legally uh, agreed to and competently uh, set out. In, 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 and in the 2003 Act, there is provision for those uh, to be um, uh, to hold sway if there is a, 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 a right to buy issue. So, so is the concern here about the potential of a community group getting access to right to buy, or is the concern about a tenant getting access to right to buy from the landowner perspective? 
concern here is that um, where, does it, where does what take precedence? Because at the moment you can have these existing options in place with a developer. Uh, and then if you bring this in as it's proposed, you then got something that's going to supersede it, which one takes precedence, because you've got one which came beforehand. But then you've also got this um, question about uh, what triggers that right to buy. If it's an automatic right to buy, and the community comes in and, and asks for a conversation about taking on a particular field, can you have a conversation with the community without triggering the right to buy so the tenant takes precedence? It's, it's unclear. Can I just follow up? The, you made a point a minute ago about um, a tenant, um, the registration of the land would yes. be good because it would clarify things. Yes. Why wouldn't that be clear enough in terms of the lease or the tenancy that you'd actually entered into with a tenant? Because we've seen examples uh, around the country where the documents registered in the land registry is actually different from that which is on the lease. And so at that point, you're able to sit down and work out which is the correct area that should be within the land registry. So that's very, very important. It's also, it also comes also to the fundamental. Some people have different ideas as to whether it's a SLDT, MLDT, or a 91 Act lease. And at that point, it, it enables that to be clarified so as well. So you see it both as a land and as a clarification of a tenancy? Yes. It, it means there's no dispute later on. So from the perspective of the tenant um, and the farming interest, you actually support this removal of the right to buy. So I want to test out the other side of the perspective on this. The, the recommendation to remove the, the requ requirement to register a, a tenant's preemptive right, that recommendation was, was made by both the Land Reform Review Group and the Ag Holdings Review Group. Now, on any, any reasonably well-managed estate, I would have thought it's pretty clear who has what type of lease and what area that lease extends to. So the, the type of lease and the area is already defined. So we don't see why, why the requirement to um, register is necessary for, for a, an agricultural lease, a secure tenancy. Um, and we're, we're aware that they're only in the region of um, just over, as far as I know, just over 1,000 tenants who have registered their right, preemptive right. Um, that's a very small proportion of the total number of secured tenancies in Scotland. And it's clear that the requirement to register is uh, um, deterring um, tenants from, from do doing it. And, and there, we know tenants on many estates who've been told quite simply that if they do register, the, the state won't look at it in a favourable light. And, and um, even to the extent that they, they won't have um, non-secure leases renewed. So it's rocking the boat. It's rocking the boat, yes. And NFUS, I think, in Sabah. Uh, well, can I bring in Niall, who's been waiting a wee bit, and then we'll get the NFU for sure. Yep. The, the other issue here is that, although the Act says existing 1991 Act tenancies, there are a, a number of what I will call grey tenancies out there where the landowner isn't potentially um, an estate with a very good terrier and records going back decades. You know, you can have a owner-occupier farmer who, for ill health or other reasons let's ground seasonally to a neighbour, but because they all know each other and all good friends, they don't have any paperwork between them at all, and that agreement continues very, very amicably until such point as there's a commercial advantage for the tenant to potentially change their, their, um, their occupation arrangement. So if there's an absence of an agreement, rent's been paid for years on end, there's no proof of gap periods, then you know, the occupier can potentially argue they have a 1991 Act tenancy. Yeah. Um, in the mainstream, I suspect that uh, those are hopefully minority situations which, you know, inevitably crop up. And we're talking about trying to deal with the mainstream situation where we'd expect professionally that people have made uh, correct uh, rent agreements which are registered in a fashion that people can understand. And that this special pleading about at the numbers of these things, we need to pin down and see whether this part of the discussion is actually something that's going to materially alter uh, the reasonable suggestion that the tenants don't need to register a right to buy. Risk that in those scenarios, these people are currently in a in a in a limbo, as it were, and it's um, you know it, at the point at the moment they might not 
publicly be telling their, their landlord, whoever that may be, that they have a 1991 Act tenancy, which by virtue would give them an automatic registration right to buy. And it then means, is that landowner potentially prejudiced in the decisions they make for that land because they make them in the assumption that they have a grazing tenant when actually the grazing tenant uses legislation to change that scenario at a later date. And currently so how many the of these are there then? How many do you think there are? More than you'd think. We Professionally, um, I've probably dealt with about three or four cases of that nature in the last three years or so. So, in the penny numbers compared to the... We'd better hear from the NFU about this one to answer Sarah's question, but uh, thank you for that elucidation. The, the general principle yeah. for us here, here is simple, that when the land's going to be sold, then the tenant should have first refusal. So that, that's what we're wanting to get to. And what we want to do is remove obstacles that may stop that happening. So at the present time, one obstacle that may stop that happening is the need to, to register. You know, I, I don't know why, but I would have thought every tenant would have registered, but they haven't for a number of reasons. So removing that provision to, to register to us would be a step forward. You know, we think that would help you know, the general feelings that, that, there, that there exists within the industry. I do recognise, though, that there are problems. And I think there are some valid problems that have been brought up because a lot of these tenancies do go back over a, you know, a huge period of time. And you would have thought that was very clear what pieces of land are actually involved. But it's not always always the case. That is clear what pieces of land land are involved. But I don't think that should be unsurmountable. You know, th those issues should be able to be dealt with. And as we try and modernise the whole relationship that exists here, you know, clarity on the leases that are available, what this applies to, what land's covered by by your lease, you know, would generally be be useful. I think one of the issues just maybe picking up on what Niall, David and Andrew have, have, have said, and I'm maybe going to misinterpret what, what they've said so they may wish to come back, is an issue that can often happen is a tenant will have multiple leases. So they'll have a lot of different types of leases that cover their farm, farm and enterprise. So sometimes confusion could reign as to what's actually covered by the right, right, right to buy. But again, that I don't see is an unsurmountable problem that would be partly an educational issue and partly maybe even a role for the, the new commissioner to, to put in place in terms of providing clarity and guidance to people as to how all this would operate in, in the future. I need to come back on that one. I think Sarah's trying to establish about the, the actual tenant's uh, requirement to register for preemptive right to buy at, at the moment. But uh, Andrew Howard and then Martin... It was, it was really to make a suggestion that might help to quantify the number of um, problem leases. I understand, and I'm not an, um, uh, I can't remember them all off by uh, heart, but I understand that the agricultural census data um, is collect, collects information about tenancies and that there's a given percentage of um, uh, tenants report that they don't know what type of tenancy they have. And so it may be that the government itself already holds information that might give a clue to the number of um, grey areas, um, if you like, which would help quantify it. I'm not seeing it on the table that I have, but I suppose we can ask them about that. So, Martin. Uh, I just want to come in. Most of what I was going to say has been covered, but the, the act of registration is in practically, at a practical level, which is what I'm involved in, is very helpful. It, it makes it absolutely clear and, and transparent about what the position is. I think the issue of hierarchy is very valid that David raised, and is particularly in, re in relation to the community right to buy um, and, and, uh, and potentially developer options, but more about which, which has precedence and, and priority. You want to go on? Yeah. One, of the, one of the points that was made by the Law Society, you, you came up with a whole raft of problems that this would create, and one of them was that um, land sales could be affected um, where there was an option agreed before the bill came into force. That's the retrospective issue. But the other one I thought was quite interesting is that you argue that where land's being sold for development, the tenant may be able to step in and buy the land at agricultural value. But in another part of the bill, we've got people saying that they're really worried that land is going to get taken out of agricultural um, use because of right to buy. So we've got two sets of balances being weighed up in different bits of the bill. And I think getting the, getting the right solution here is actually quite important. 
If there's less a question, it's more of a comment, having just heard both sides. I think okay. we're going to have to reflect on it afterwards. Absolutely uh, spot on. Um, because also what we don't want to do is get to a position where we start to stifle development within the countryside because of nobody quite knows where their, their legal footing is. So I think that was recommendation 18 in, in the review group was about trying to clarify those trigger points, which has not been brought forward into the bill. And as such, I think it's, it's, it's missing. Okay. Any other points on Sarah have to make just now? Nope. Right. Well, I'm going to have a five-minute break, comfort break, um, and uh, we'll then go on with the next set of questions, which will be...
start just now. Thank you. If you take your seats again. So we're going to return to questions now, and this is about uh, the sale where the landlord is in breach. And uh, Graham Day is going to lead this one. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Scottish Land and Estates has expressed the view and evidence that forced sale is not reciprocal to the landlord's right to obtain a certificate of bad husbandry, which of course would result in the removal of the tenant, because, and I quote, being forced to give up a tenancy does not equate to being forced to give up ownership. The tenant loses a right of occupation. The landowner would lose a right of ownership. I welcome views on that viewpoint. And in seeking the views, I'd be interested to hear from the witnesses how, in practice, the certificate of bad husbandry, that system, is actually working. OK, who's going to start? Christopher Nicholson. Um, yeah, the, the, the sale where landlord in breach, Chapter 3, um, in a way that's a countermeasure to the um, ability of a landlord to issue a certificate of bad husbandry and dispossess a, a tenant. Um, the, I've got a couple of points to make. Um, while um, the sale where landlord in a breach may result in a, in a landlord losing... Um, part of his um, holding. Um, conversely, when a, when a, a t tenant is dispossessed through um, a certificate of bad husbandry, the tenant is losing um, his, his interest in his lease, his livelihood, and his home. It's actually far more draconian than the consequences of a, a landlord losing part of, um, say, one holding on, on an estate. And the other point I'd make is that sale where landlord is in breach, the, the measures in the bill ensure that the landlord is fully compensated for his losses. In stark contrast to the tenant who is dispossessed um, through a certificate of bad husbandry, who leaves without any compensation for his interest in his lease, um, though he is eligible for compensation for his improvements. So there seems to be strong recognition of the landlord's property rights, but very little recognition of the tenant's property rights and the interest of, in his interest in, in his lease. Um, and in reality, we don't expect to see the, any tenant go through the whole process that is, is, is in the Chapter 3. Um, I know there are some stakeholders who have been asking for a strengthening of the certificate of bad husbandry and measures um, to ensure that tenants um, farm properly and, and maintain their, their farm and carry out repairs. As far as we're concerned, all those tools are there. It's quite common for tenants to be given notices to carry out repairs or do maintenance. And if there's an accumulation of those notices not acted on, then a landlord is entitled to... Um, go to the land court for a certificate of bad husbandry, which will result in that t tenant lose, losing his um, interest in his lease. Andrew Howard. Um, Chris, that, the, uh, that both provisions, bad husbandry and the um, sale where the landlord is in beach, are dra draconian. I mean, that's what they're supposed to be. They're a, um, they're a uh, method of last resort, really. Um, uh, I don't have a difficulty in principle with the proposal if the landlord has got himself into that position. Um, and it's quite a long and robust procedure. Well, you know, that's his lookout, really. Um, what is important, I guess, is that the, um, the process and that the rules surrounding each, whether it be um, a breach by the tenant or a breach by the landlord, are appropriate and up to date. Um, I, I think. The only observation I'd make about the bad husbandry um, provisions are that, from my own experience, having looked at them a few years ago, they um, haven't been updated or reviewed for a long time, as I understand it, um, appear really to relate to the sort of technical um, aspects of farming that might have felt more appropriate a few decades ago, 
and I'm, I'm not suggesting for one minute that they should be strengthened, but it may be that they ought to be reviewed to make sure that they remain relevant. They're certainly not used very often. Yeah, um, just I mean, to follow on from Andrew. From Scottish land and the state's point of view, um, it is a draconian step to be, have the land removed from you. Um, but I think the process as it exists within the bill is robust. Uh, and I think it offers enough protections there for the landowner to be able to be uh, confident and given the chance to remedy any breach, because we're not here to condone uh, poor land ownership at all. Um, it's also making sure that there is cognizance in there that ultimately the person who's going to benefit from this process would be the tenant, so that all the safeguards are in there to, to, to take fair recognition of that. Again, to reiterate regarding the question about bad husbandry, um, we have looked at it both personally and, and also within an organization, and um, generally the feeling is when you speak that people just do not use it because it's not fit for purpose. It's not the matter of, of strengthening it, they just feel that it's not going to get anywhere. Uh, and that I think there's been five cases in the last 50 years or something which would suggest that it's um, not really operating the way it was intended to do because I can't believe that that's the sole number of cases where it would apply to. There are sorts of technical issues within there that you don't have a record of condition to compare it back to, etc. But looking at that at the same time would send out a clear, balanced, fair message. Yeah, the, 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 let's look at this from a slightly different direction. If it's not fit for purpose, and it were made fit for purpose, we're all in the business here to try to ensure that land is utilised in the best interests of, 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 of all of us. So if there were to be changes made to it and it were made fit for purpose, would the panellists accept that in that instance we should build a safeguard in there which says that if the landowner is able to reclaim the land, it should not be with a view to being brought back in hand when we're trying to ensure that tenancies are protected, but with a view to being passed on to a new entrant or with a view to being split up bet between other tenancies. We hear very often that there are a lot of unviable units out there so that they were shared with the other tenancies, perhaps on an estate, thereby safeguarding the future of those tenancies and securing employment, etc., etc. Thinking off the top of my head, but I think the answer, the simple answer to that is yes, I would have a lot of merit, and I can see um, the logic in ensuring that land effectively stays within the tenanted sector, moving on to either a new entrant or different farms. I think there are practical issues to resolve within this, because if you've got it from the, from the point of your certificate of bad husbandry, it probably means the farm's going to be in pretty poor order mm. anyway and require a large amount of capital investment to get it back up there. Well, that's the how do we do it, not what we should do, and I think that measure has a good deal of merit in it. Scott Walker. Uh, deal with the second question, question there. It, it certainly that's not an issue we've discussed with our members in, in any, any meetings that, that we've, we've had. Um, so I'm making an assumption here as to, to what our, our members would, would think. But I would, have, I would think they'd think that a, it's a good, credible um, concept and it's one that should be explored and one that they would generally support in, in principle. That would be my, my assumption. Um, going back to, say, the for sale part, part view, where we have discussed this, this with the, the mem membership, uh, the general view is you know, people don't believe the enforced sale would be used. You know, but what they believe is it's a hugely important tool uh, to strengthen the armory where something isn't going right, so that people know that that's the ultimate sanction and therefore it's something that encourages you know, the landlord to put things, things in, in, into, into pra practice. So we think it's, it's an important lever to have there, albeit we wouldn't judge its success on whether it actually uh, delivers any enforced sale in, in the future. Christopher Nicholson. Um, going back to Graham Day's point about what happens to um, land where a, a tenant is removed through a certificate of bad husbandry, I would have thought it's, it's clearly in the public interest to ensure that that land is re-let, but on the same terms that it had been let beforehand, um, it would be rather meaningless to um, re-let it on a five-year SLDT and then at the end of the five years it's, it's taken out of the tenanted sector. So these certificates are more likely to be used in the situations where the security of tenure 
and we feel that there's a strong public interest argument to continue that security of tenure. Let me move on then, Kavino. Again, looking at some of the evidence we've taken as a committee, the STFA have claimed that Section 38N, as it stands, would significantly impact on the tenant's ability to borrow in order to facilitate the purchase of the holding due to concerns regarding the size of uh, possible clawback. They've also said that the clawback should be limited to the original interest of the landlord in the lease and not include improvements made by the tenant under the tenancies. I just, again, seek the views of the panel as to whether these are valid uh, concerns. David Johnson. Um, I think it's, it's correct that there should be a clawback underneath there, um, where there's been a massive uplift in value as a result of a forced sale within a reasonable period of time. Um, but as, as Chris has alluded to, there shouldn't be a clawback for tenants, in, for tenants, in, tenants improvements within the lease. I and mean, that seems to me to be fair and reasonable. Andrew Howard. As have been used in uh, where farms have been sold from estates to tenants before, and I'm assuming that those tenants have used bank finance to help support that purchase, um, I would imagine that uh, as long as the provisions of the clawback are clear, that the banks will um, be able to live with that and to take that into account when they're putting together their finance package. I think there's a <clears throat> there is an interesting question that, that comes about um, in these provisions about who acquires the farm if the tenant um, doesn't. Um, because the market for the acquisition of farms with a tenant in place in Scotland has virtually evaporated, certainly as a standalone unit. Um, and uh, I think it would call into question whether you could sell the unit at all in certain circumstances, particularly if there was a history of litigation with the tenant and that um, there, were, the, there were problems with fixed equipment or something else on the holding. Yes, then begs the question, what happens if there is no buyer? Maybe the Scottish Government would like to buy it. Or the local council. Or the local authority, yeah. Yeah. The I mean, that was, one, that was one of the ideas that was mooted, I think, when this was first um, kicked around as an idea, that perhaps rather than the, the tenant being the purchaser, so that you then perhaps create in a small way an incentive to create a problem because they get to acquire, I think that that's highly unlikely because the provisions are robust, um, that, the, that the new owner, if you like, would be an arm of government or local government who would then assume the role of landlord. They may not wish that, of course, but... Uh... Any other thoughts? Uh, well, Scott Walker and Chris Nicholson, then Christian Aller. Uh, again, this is me speaking from sort of more a personal view rather than one that's really been tested with, with our, our membership as, as a whole. But we talked before about the local authority being, being the, the pur purchaser. Um, which has got mixed views, I've got to say, by, by our membership in, in different areas of, of, of the country. As, as a general concept, though, the Crown Estate has traditionally been, been felt as a, a better landlord, you know, uh, somebody who has uh, in, invested in, in, in farms. So I think as, as a general concept, the Crown Estate might be seen as a more favourable um, owner should this provision be, be used. Christopher Nicholson. Um, I, I think we're talking about a very hypothetical situation. I, I doubt many um, cases will get to this stage. But in the event that a, a tenant is not wishing to purchase his holding in that situation, then I think it would make sense for um, government to take the opportunity to purchase it and, and, and create opportunities for new entrants. And in the past, there's been a clear public interest argument for the small land hold, the, the, the small holdings after the war, created after the war, and also um, looking across the border to England, there are 3,000 um, starter units owned by councils in, in England. So something, Scotland's missing something similar. Um, uh, Christian Allard. Now, I'm quite interested about what happened to land when there is no buyer. And uh, yes, Scottish Government is one of the ideas put forward as a Crown. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't think it's a Crown estate. I think 
it's another legislation of parts of the Crown that will take it over. But it's another way that this legislation is about uh, the public good, so public interest. So common good land could maybe come into it. Well, uh, that's uh, anybody would a suggestion about it becoming common good land uh, that Chris John has raised. Put it on the table. People are uh, not likely to comment at the moment, or are you? Okay, you're not going to comment. Thank but uh, thank you for the point. Any further no, issues on that? Right, well, we're going to move on to rent reviews. Um, there's a change to the basis in setting rents for 1991 tenancies, that's for sure. Uh, because, first of all, you know, the, uh, the panel, you know, how do you understand what the change means in terms of... Uh, uh, broadly, looking at productive capacity, do you think that uh, rents will go up or down? What does it mean for the investment in the holding uh, as such? Andrew Howard. Um, I don't think we know at the moment. Um, uh, or they could do both, and um, quite violently as well over a period of time. Um, as I understand it, the one of the policy objectives behind changing the way in which rents are um, reviewed to productive capacity is to increase transparency and clarity about how the process works and also to reduce conflict. <coughs> um, I mean, I have some pretty serious concerns. Well, I have two concerns. Um, the first is that we haven't got the detail of how this will work on the face of the bill. That's largely because it's still being worked up between the various um, representative bodies in the, in the background. Um, and for something as um, transformational as this in terms of the, a major change, I think it would have been extremely helpful to have seen this on the face of the bill. Um, the second concern I've got is that I'm not sure that it's going to achieve, well, in fact, I'm pretty clear it's not going to achieve the objective of reduced conflict over rents. Um, certain things, like agreeing what the productive capacity of the farm might be, agreeing the nature of the farm, the fixed equipment, that sort of thing, well, I don't see that being particularly problematic, and in many respects that will um, aligns with what we do in practice for the current process, because you have to agree what farm you're um, ag agreeing the rent for. But then what's got to happen is that everybody's got to agree what the farming system would be on that farm because we'll be looking at the hypothetical farming of that farm for the hypothetical tenant. Um, and it could be that that system is substantially different from that which the tenant is employing, um, which may in itself create or raise some eyebrows. Um, the next thing you've got to do is to work out, well, what will the output from that farm be, which again is a potential source of discussion and disagreement because there might be, um, you, you may for instance be sitting there looking at um, a hypothetical output for that area that's been derived from wider figures which is substantially exceeding that which the tenant himself is agreeing um, and then you've got to agree what your pricing is. Um, now I think the original intention would be that had been that this could be based on actual figures that had been published but of course the difficulty with that in the modern world is that it's so volatile that producing figures on prices three years ago would result in um, rent determinations now that would be most unwelcome because they would be inappropriate to the circumstances. So you're going to have to use very up-to-date data. Now, for certain products, that's easy to get hold of. For others, it's a bit more complicated. But I think you're also going to have to consider what weight you give to future projections of where prices are expected to go because you're about to set a rent that's going to look forward for three years and if you know that prices are about to fall off a cliff well all parties are going to want to take it certainly one party is going to want to take that into account and that needs to be clear so you've then got a financial output from the, this hypothetical model which could be substantially in excess of the financial output that the farmer himself is obtaining so he's feeling probably quite concerned about that already and then you have the thorny business of how you divide the divisible surplus how you divide the profit um, and I can understand why the government has given no guidance on that. Um, but the parties then have to sit there and say, well, how are we going to divvy up this profit? Now, this might be a profit, of course, a hypothetical profit, which is substantially in excess of the profit that the actual tenant is generating. So 
the idea that, that this is going to lead to less conflict between the parties, I can only see this being more complex, um, and instead of having really one area over which you might disagree, which is the interpretation of some comparable evidence, you've got a whole series of points in this um, calculation at which the parties, should they wish to, uh, could take issue with each other. And, and some of them over quite fundamental things like, and a very personal thing like, how do we divide the profit on the farm? So uh, I'm, I'm afraid I foresee trouble ahead, which concerns me a lot. Well, there's trouble behind us as well. Trouble is everywhere. Um, Scott Walker. White, you know, through, from our tenant members, uh, there still remains widespread support for this idea, you know, the concept. So any time we speak to members about uh, they like what's being, being proposed. And again, it's, it's picking up on the two points that, that Andrew's touched about. They do see it as being, you know, providing greater transparency and they do see it as being a means of uh, reducing conflict. And that's how they'll judge, judge success. At this point of time, though, um, the, I would have hoped we would have been far further on in the background work that's going on just now. And there's a lot of very detailed background work going on. People spend a lot of time, time on it to be able to flesh this out so that we could actually have you know, proper informed discussions with farmers across the country to say, this is, this is the process you're going to have to go through. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it would apply in your scenario. Therefore, let's get, get feed, feedback. And I think it's important that that work gets done as quickly as possible. And then that work gets actually road tested with, with, with people. Because if, if we don't actually get to a situation where there's greater transparency, and we don't get to a situation where you know, the conflict's actually reduced, then for us, what we're trying to achieve here would fail. You know, it falls, it fall, falls down. And just now, we can't say how that's actually going to, going to turn, turn out. I do know, though, that everyone that's participating in the work is participating in it in the correct manner and trying to you know, get a productive outcome out of it. But it is a detailed, complex, complex area. Nicholson. Um, the, the, the key part of this measure for tenants is the move away from the open market test. Um, in the last few years, the, the land court and other stakeholders have recognised that the open market test can result in rents that levels that are more than viable. And that is a wholly unfair situation for long-term tenants to be in, to have their rent based on what someone else in the marketplace is prepared to pay for a short-term lease. Um, so we welcome the move away from the, the open market. We believe that um, going down the road of the productive capacity which should ensure that rents for secure tenants and other long-term tenancies using the, the, that test will be set at a viable level. Um, we believe it will be much more transparent in that most farmers are pretty familiar with, with budgets and um, many organisations publish um, standard budgets looking forward each, each year at this, this time of year for the following year. Um, so the, the evidence is there that, that's, that's required. Um, and we see that as being far, having far greater transparency than the current attempts by the industry to... And the industry has struggled um, in the last five years with coming to grips with um, mechanisms to deal with scarcity and marriage value. And sensibly, the review group have recommended that, that we move away from uh, a test that involves um, such grey gray areas. Um, in common with um, what Scott mentioned, um, there is concern that the, the modelling is... is um, is not taking place far early enough on in the process, but I believe that we will will get there. Um, there's nothing new about the concept of the rent being based on the hypothetical tenant um, using the fixed equipment provided by the landlord, and we think that that key principle, which has been the principle of, of rents for for um, since, ever since rent provisions came in, that principle should be stated in the bill because it's conveniently forgotten in many rent reviews at present that, that it's based on the hypothetical tenant using the fixed equipment provided by the landlord. 
Can you see the modelling early, uh, if at all possible? But well, to, well to, to, to ensure that it takes place and is road tested. Um, yeah. So the phasing in, I guess, is what you're talking about there mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the clauses in the bill. Uh, once we've yeah, seen what's but happened. But in, in principle, we're heading in the right direction, we believe. Okay, that point. David Johnson. Um, the, key, the key to this is trying to get a fair rent for both the tenant and the landlord at the end of the day. And that is the aim we're trying to do. Also, to minimise any potential conflict that we have at arriving at those fair rents um, under the new process. Um, the, we feel very strongly that this should be clearly stated within the legislation. It's absolutely fundamental key to relationships going forward into the future. And the fact that we don't have much to look at at the moment is deeply concerning. Uh, we are working, as Scott alluded to, very, very hard with the civil servants behind the scenes trying to road test it. Um, but we have great, great concerns that this is not going to result in a simplification that people think it's going to result in and could potentially create more conflict unless it's brought in and road tested absolutely to, to the nth degree. Um, there's also concerns within this uh, bill to do with housing and how the rents for housing was going to be calculated, as was mentioned in the Ag Holdings Review Group. Um, it appears that uh, the housing element has been removed out of this, so in theory you could have two 200-acre farms, one with a house, one without a house, which is paying exactly the same rent, but there are obligations on the landlord to maintain that house. So that also begs questions about the fairness. Um, I think, as it's been alluded to under the NFUS evidence in theory, you don't have to sit on the housing, you don't have to reside on a, on a holding anymore. So the tenant themselves could then let that house out, which in many instances would create um, an income greater than the rent of the farm in its own right. That also goes to the heart of fairness and balance within it. So there's a huge amount of work to be done on this to get to a situation where we can comment further on it and be comfortable with it. If not this, then what? If not this, system if, if not... The system proposed. Um, well, we had the review group uh, from TFF look at the, the old way of doing the rents, and they were um, saying that the system is not perfect, but what is required is greater clarity around things like marriage value and scarcity that Chris has alluded to, uh, to take away the sort of the greyness of it. And in a sense, we're seeing the greyness coming back in here because we've got divisible surpluses, which we're going to be split, we know not how. Um, I think there's, for me personally, what I'd like to see would be the productive element capacity brought into Section 13, so that's then given weight as part of the, the evidential process when you're doing a rent review. If you like, it becomes a sense check at the moment that's not in there, it's not included, as far as I'm aware, so you can't use it as a measure. But that would be a simple way of bringing that in there to, for all parties to work towards. It doesn't rule out the problems that there are disputes about the previous parts of the formula that you talk about. But then a lot of these um, disputes that have gone on are very much part of the clarification of the process of what the previous legislation was meant to do. So you end up going back through the land court, which clarifies it, which gives you case evidence to um, go forward for the, for the future. When we start doing this process again, we're going to put that back to, to, to year dot. And so we'll have to end up probably back in a land court seeking to clarify exactly what is meant and how do we interpret it. So there is a risk of greater conflict. But I'm quite interested to know if this productive capacity approach will uh, allow rents to become more transparent. Um, will it allow rents to become more transparent? I don't know. I, mean, I haven't got the details in which to comment on that. And that's half the problems that we have. Well, OK, we've accepted there's a modelling process going on. You're involved in it, all mm -hmm. of you. Uh, so this is an ongoing issue, which the bill will have to take into account right through to stage three. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is called process to attempt to get progress. Uh, it's an approach. It's slightly different one than what, what we've had. But uh, we definitely need to have some kind of approach that makes progress. Yes, uh, I, mean, I mean, one things on a practical nature, we will, issues for rent will be um, sent out ahead of 20th November this year for 20th November next year. Yeah. We don't know exactly what the methodology will be. So well, it's sure this uncertainty which isn't helping. 
I'm sure that civil servants will be listening to this. Andrew Howard. Uh, I accept Chris's point that in theory, uh, under the current system, and I think actually this would apply the under the new system as well, that you could, in theory, you could end up with a rent which is beyond that which is viable. But I don't think there's any practical evidence that that is the case. In fact, one of the things that came out from the discussions when the um, Agricultural Holdings Review Group toured the country was that there wasn't any evidence that rents were unreasonable. Um, the concerns tended to point to um, uh, a lack of clarity about how certain adjustments were being made and some concerns that some agents weren't adjusting enough in comparing evidence from LDTs to um, back to 1991 Act tenancies. But I would certainly argue that the rent pattern, and if you look at graphs of um, rents under the existing system, they're stable and any increases have tended to be very steady and they haven't reacted to either volatility in the commodity market or changes in other um, uh, um, influencing factors such as the CAP. So they provide a pretty steady basis on which both partners in that business can make their decisions. One of my concerns about where we're going, it may well be transparent and that everybody can see and argue about how the rent has been calculated, but, um, and Sava can perhaps comment if I've misunderstood what was said at one of the review sessions, but I think some calculations have been done um, based on one of the farms in a, in a recent rent review case, um, and they looked at the potential rents that could be paid under this type of system between, I think, the years 2006 and 2012. And the figures varied from 8,000 to 80,000 or thereabouts. Martin's nodding, so that's encouraging. Now, that isn't, in my view, a very solid basis on which to um, create a rent review system which is going to lead to happy relationships and a solid and stable basis for businesses to carry on. Okay. Uh, I think we've... Uh, ex Christopher Nicholson, come back. Just one point about rent levels. If you look at the average, uh, average rent levels in Scotland over a 10-year period, there is, there is stability. But when you start looking at settled rents or rents that have been agreed since the Moonsey decision... Um, then you add a huge element of uncertainty, and we are seeing rents that are clearly not viable. Um, in the arable sector around here, you have rents approaching £100 an acre, and uh, but basic arithmetic of uh, land that grows spring barley um, with average yields at average prices, long-term you cannot pay a rent of £100 an acre. So this is where the nub of the argument is about uh, probably thinking of this new approach perhaps being phased in, uh, you know, over a period of time, you know, that the bill suggests, all right, we talk about the November time for the rents for the following year, but it could well be the case that, uh, you know, we suggest that uh, actually we spend more time before uh, the, 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 the rents in the new system are actually brought in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we hear what you're saying about the difficulties of moving from one to the other. Sarah Boyack. Yeah, a quick point of clarification, really, for the record. Um, it's right that we're expecting that there's going to be more clarity on this by the end of October, isn't it? Mm. So I think that's one issue that, if it's not been agreed yet, um, we've got the general idea that's being floated at the moment, we can come back to this once we see what it actually looks like. Because we'll be, that will be what at least a month before we have the stage one debate on the bill. Yeah, indeed. OK, I think that's, that these points are made. I think we'll move on to assignation and succession now. Uh, Dave Thompson to lead. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, the proposals in the bill um, will widen the classes of uh, family members who can have uh, tenancies assigned to them quite considerably. And the policy memorandum states that that's to encourage tenants to retire or move on with dignity and uh, confidence. Um, it would also uh, help to maintain the number of tenancies. So I'd like to ask the panel just initially what they feel about widening the classes um, as proposed in the bill. Right, who's going to start off there? Christopher Nicholson. Um, 
over the last 60 years, the ability of a tenant to um, pass on his his lease interest in his lease through through family succession or, or, or assignation or bequest has been steadily narrowed down. So in 1958, the the prior to 1958, a tenant could be quit, leave bequest his lease to any person and then it became any family member and then it was narrowed down to near relatives so this is really redressing the balance um partly back to where where, where it was before um there are other reasons for for looking at it you there are changes in um, family structures um it's now common for uh, uh, the successor of a farmer say it's his son or daughter to um, pursue employment elsewhere, and there might be a nephew or a niece who's interested in taking over the over the lease. Um, families have changed; the job market's more fluid, um, and combined with the ever increasing interest that tenants have through investment in their holdings and improvements, um, it seems only fair and, and sensible and in the public interest that the very narrow de definition of near relative has is, is, is been allowed to widen. Um, to inc include nephews and nieces. We would argue that um, there are a number of cases where you find cousins far farming in partnership because they're descended from a, a grandfather who, who held the tenancy. And um, our suggestion is that if where you do find a c cousins in, in, in a par far farming business and there's a connection there, the c one cousin should be able to leave his lease to the other cousin. And cousins are not included in the current... Um, measure in, in, in the bill. Uh, who's uh, Mark Scott Walker? As, as we've gone around the country, uh, speak to members on this huge polarised views, you know, on, on this whole issue of assignation and, and su succession. Um, I think dealing with things that I think are relatively simple to, to begin begin with is. There are situations where somebody's been actively involved in the farm business, uh, but because of the way that the, the law is, is written just now, they may, f they may find that they are not entitled uh, to have that tenancy passed, passed on, on to them. Now, in many situations, the an arrangement will come to play between um, you know, the, the future tenant and the existing landlord, and that situation will be sorted out. But there's one or two situations that have been highlighted in recent years where that hasn't uh, arisen and there's been disputes that have, have happened as, as, a, as a consequence. So we've, we've been very clear that in those sort of situations, you would want to find some way of accommodating those individuals. Somebody's clearly been involved in, in the farm tenancy, you know, perhaps as, as, uh, um, as Christopher said, you know, in essence been a partner. In, in the business, but find that they cannot continue in the business in its current form, and would like to see see those sort of situations situations res resolved. As you get wider and wider um, in terms of what you would mean by assignation and, and succession, there's then this balance to be be achieved as to what are you actually trying to to sort sort out, what are you trying to achieve, what's the objectives of 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 the bill. For us, the vast majority of individuals have somebody to succeed to, so will be covered by, by the bill. What you're then looking at is a small number of in individuals who don't have some, somebody to succeed to. And that's where partly it brings us back to the conversation that we had earlier about secure tenancies, conversion to fixed term. You know, there's a tool there you've got to bear, bear in mind. So there's a whole set of circumstances here that you've got to, th to think about. One of the factors that we'd also throw, throw up, which has been uh, removed, is about the viable unit test. Now, again, depending on how wide you, you wish to um, take assignation and succession, there's maybe a role there for the viable unit test to be, to be brought into, into play so that individuals can't simply stack up tenancies if what we're trying to achieve here is to perpetuate tenancies and to get them as widespread as, as possible. So there's a number of factors at play, which will maybe let others speak and then come, come, come back, if I, if I, if I may. Uh, David Johnson. Thank you, um, Like Scott, I think this is probably one of the single biggest issues that's 
provided concern to our membership. Um, as we look at the proposals, as they stand for the widening of succession and assignation, they are so broad and so wide that, in effect, what you are creating is, is perpetuation of the tenancies forevermore. It's highly unlikely that you're ever going to be able to not find somebody to assign the tenancy or to succeed it under the breadth of which it's going. And, it's, Chris, it's far wider than nephew or niece. It's sort of step-grandchild and out as far as that. So um, that provides fundamental concerns for us and our membership. Um, it goes to the very heart of confidence in you letting the sector, letting the intent of the sector, because this is a major retrospective change to the agreement that we have on, already in, in place between tenants and the landlord. I totally take on board what Scott was saying about the hardship cases and where people have been genuinely working on the farms for a period of time and driving the livelihood and to all intents and purposes, the arrangement and the ongoing daily contact between the estate and the farmer is with that person. And that seems to me a sensible way of trying to find a methodology to get them into that tenancy. Um, I would also try and understand the, the, the public benefit between perpetuating the tenancies. The public benefit is to ensure the farms are farmed well. If you're widening succession, then nothing happens until the point of that person dies, so the person's in the farm right up until that point. Assignation, as it stands in the way I see it, you could get situations where a relatively small farm with a big farmhouse is assigned to somebody who doesn't particularly wish to farm it. Farm it well, might have a few horses, uh, and a nice way to live. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in the public interest for the productive capability of that farm being used. So this here goes hand in hand with sorting out the way gain provisions to make sure they're fair for the tenants, um, but also with conversion. Conversion we see as a much better way of ensuring the churn and the, and, and the flexibility within the sector to allow the farms to be farmed well. So, Andrew Howard. Um, well, like David, I'm extremely concerned by this. Um, <clears throat> it appears that what, what this provision is trying to do is to keep land, force land, to stay in the tenanted sector. Um, rather than creating a positive framework which, is, which would encourage anybody that has land who doesn't want to farm it at that particular point um, to include land in the tenanted um, sector, which I don't think is a very um, helpful way to try and um, guide people's um, uh, uh, sort of decision-making. Um, I actually think it's going to be counterproductive because for the roughly 20% of um, tenancies where there doesn't appear to be an identifiable successor, I think they're roughly the Scottish Government's figures, those particular landlords are going to feel that they've been deprived very immediately of an opportunity to restructure their affairs, to consider what they're going to do with um, that farm going um, forward, because they had legitimate expectations that that, land was go that tenancy was going to end. Um, uh, I think that that increases the chance that the policy would be challenged at some point um, because their property rights would have been infringed and there doesn't seem to be any provision in the bill for recognising that um, their rights have uh, been infringed. I think that increases the chance of landlord intervention. So they're going to take the view that, well, if this lease is being assigned to somebody, I'm going to tr try and do a deal with the tenant so that I can buy it out and it will be lost to the tenanted sector probably because it seems unlikely that having had to go through that, um, uh, that process that they're going to let it out again. Um, and unless it's actually um, seriously constrained in some way, it's not going to help new entrants and aspiring farmers at all. It's going to go straight to larger established farms who will pay the substantial price that people would pay to get hold of a secure tenancy. Now, when you're valuing a conversion, you would really be valuing a, um, a cash flow of future profits um, because that's what you're getting. Um, these tenancies would go for substantially more because I think the acquirer would also be thinking, well, I've got other rights, like a preemptive right to buy. Um, the landlord's um, likely to have uh, more stringent um, liabilities over the fixed equipment on the farm rent may well be that little bit less, and they may also think that they're going to get future rights granted to secure tenants in the future. So I think these would trade for a substantial sum of money. Um, now, if the objective is to provide people with an outlet to retire, then that's exactly what conversion is providing. So I'm not quite sure why this policy is necessary, 
particularly if more um, surgical changes could be made that deal with a small number of cases where hardship would be um, evident to the um, aspiring tenant, whether they, whether they be a nephew or a cousin or something like that, because they've clearly been involved in the business for a substantial period of time. We've got a supplementary about this and then come back to Dave. Uh, thank you for letting me, let me in, Convener. Uh, really, this is a question about, for clarity. We use this phrase, viable unit, all the time. Um, what do we actually mean by it? Because if you look at the, uh, if you forgive me a second, the, the formal definition of a viable unit is an agricultural unit which, in the opinion of the Land Court, is capable of providing an individual occupying it with full-time employment and the means to pay the rent payable in respect to the unit and for adequate maintenance of the unit. Is that viability in its true sense in terms of a business? Because I, I look at figures from the 2014 Scottish Government survey of tenant farms. Now, one third of tenant farmers say their total turnover in 2013 was more than 100,000. 10% are saying that turnover was 50 to 100,000. 19% said they were below 50,000. And interestingly, a third said they didn't know what their turnover was for the previous year. So I guess my question is, What's actually happening out there in the tenant sector? Do we have a large number of viable units, or are they struggling? Chris Nicholson. Um, linking it into vi the viable unit test to succession, uh, the process of succession is probably the riskiest period that any f fa family tenancy goes through. Um, at, the, at present, following a succession of a t tenant, the landlord has, um, I think it's up to two years, to object to the successor um, on the basis of a viable unit rule. Um, it's, it's an incredibly risky process and a worry for all, all um, tenanted um, f fam tenant family f farms. Um, we welcome the review group's pro proposals because it removes that risk and it adds simplifi simplification of the succession process. Um, the viable unit test is, is, is judgmental. It's a moving target. Um, we see it as, as being unnecessary because it, it adds too much risk to the, to the succession problem. And interestingly, looking at the DEFRA Future of Farming report f um, from England, their recommendation is that the equivalent test in England, which is uh, called the commercial unit test, should be removed, and also that the family succession for tenancies should be widened. So the DEFRA south of the border are looking at the same measures that the review group have recommended in, in Scotland. So I think there's a lot of sense in, in removing these unnecessary complexities that add a huge element of risk to succession. Be clear. Uh, where I'm coming at from this is David Johnson, I think, makes the point that there is a danger from these proposals that we lock in existing patterns of tenancy. If that happens, what are we actually locking in? Are we locking in patterns of tenancy where these farms are actually not successfully functioning? That's what I'm trying to get at. Well, I think where, 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 where a tenancy becomes so small that it's not viable, a tenant will, the next generation of tenants will not wish to farm it and you see that um, happening all, all the time so it's a significant issue out there at the moment Graham I think you've hit the nail on the head it's a fundamental problem there are a raft of different farming sizes across the whole both the owner occupier and the tenanted sector um, and in the tenanted sector there are farms which are more than two or three man units but there are some which are now no longer viable they were created 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago and the viable unit and the, the cost per unit production has gone up that they are no longer able to support, as it's described within that. Um, and Chris, we're not seeing them coming back, as you were saying, when they become, because if you, ha if you widen the succession the way you're talking about, it becomes a very nice place to have a house and a few fields and have a few horses and stuff. It doesn't get to the heart of allowing farms to restructure. We're gonna be going through a period of lower commodity prices with increased input prices. We're gonna have probably in 2020, the single farm payment that's gonna go down as a result of review of cap. We've got to allow the farming industry to restructure in this period to get it competitive for the 21st century. And this is all part of it. This is locking in and not allowing that competitive restructuring to go on. Christopher Nicholson. Um, in terms of the, the smaller units that 
in the past have been considered non non viable, the review group identified those units as um, being suitable for starter farms because starter farms, by definition, are often part time holdings. So that was the argument for removing the that side of the viable unit test that th those small units should remain some of them should remain as opportunities for new new entrants um, there is the other side of the viable unit test which would allows a landlord to object to the succession of a tenant if um, he already is in possession of a viable unit and while we can see some of the arguments for that we think that that adds a huge level of uncertainty into the um, process of succession for tenants and we welcome the fact that this bill um, does not contain that provision. And if we come back to Dave's original <laughs> yeah, thread in a minute, but Jim Hume wants to. Oh, yeah, it's just follow, following on for uh, just really wanting a little bit more detail. Obviously, this is one of the more controversial parts, and the same, and Dave, uh, and if you have said there was a polarisation within its members. Um, but said some sort of compromise, for the example of the cousins who'd been working in uh, tandem for some time, which I think the land and the states uh, seem to agree. So it'd be interesting to hear from SDFE if the succession and assignation to extended family members would be to extended family members in their view that have perhaps not had uh, uh, any experience on the farm or worked on the farm, or, or would it be only for in their view, people who had actually had some involvement on the holdings. I th I th if I'm going to respond, I, th I think I think it's dangerous to say that the succession can has to be limited to those who have involvement in the holdings, because in many cases um, the holding is not sufficient to support two generations of one family, and there may well be the intention of the next generation to farm, but they choose not to farm. Um, while the previous generation is still there for a, a, a number of reasons. One is, can the holding provide for two families? And secondly, any young farmer is probably better advised to um, gain, gain experience of farm management from further afield rather than staying on a family holding where he was raised, so, or he or she was raised. So um, there, there are many tenant, ten, tenant successors who have every intention of returning to farm at, on the tenanted holding, but they're not going to until there is um, a place for them. So I think the review group is, is uh, sorry, the, the, the bill and the review group is, is the measures there are, are correct, that you shouldn't restrict it yeah. to people with, with the current involvement. So Andrew Howard. The test would be less of a concern if we had some of the other provisions that um, exist south of the border, because Chris has raised the, um, the point there, the secure tenancies come to an end after three generations. So the landlord has, um, if he doesn't have a precise date, he knows that he's got a period of uh, um, or an opportunity to take stock to make those changes that Niall referred to earlier, which we don't have. Now, it always seemed to me that if you were going to have security of tenure, then a reasonable quid pro quo for that was that, the, that there were at least some opportunities that the landlord could expect that that farm would come back in hand. And one way that that's been achieved is to have a relatively narrow um, definition of, of the near relative so that the farm could stay in the immediate family, but wasn't able to go out into what would be quite a wide class of successors and assignees and effectively what's been um, as David's already said here you're creating perpetual tenancies where the owner of the property has virtually no expectation of ever being able to reorganize their affairs now I think that that's a sufficiently um, large sort of impact on their ability to manage their own assets that it's almost like it's almost certainly going to get challenged by somebody at some point which runs the risk of having the industry in limbo whilst that is resolved. Uh, did Mike Gascoigne have any point here to make about the open to challenge issue? I find it quite difficult to repeat myself in, in this uh, sort of context but that the society does not bother itself with government policy. We're here to 
establish whether the law that you're proposing works. But it's, uh, we, we, we do not comment on, on policy, on government policy. Okay. Um, first of all, Christopher Nicholson, then David Johnson. There, there are clearly some stakeholders who, who um, want to see greater opportunity to, to um, t terminate security of tenure. And I understand that you see that, that the increase, the widening of family succession is, is denying the opportunity in some cases to um, break that security of tenure. However, certainly amongst our membership, the vast majority of leases predate the narrowing of family succession. So we're actually in a position now where family succession from, from the perspective of a landlord is, is more favourable than what it was when the majority of leases started. David? Ninety-one Act tenancies were created as fixed-term vehicles, which were then altered to go on to these perpetual tenancies. So we can go back as far or as short as we like to, to, to provide different viewpoints. Um, we could also perhaps suggest that landlords, as I once did, you know, have to change every two generations as well. But um, anyway, well, that's I mean, a landlords debate for another day. Yes. Well, the landlords have changed, and land has changed, and land has changed dramatically over the last 50 years. Um, we've been trying to understand um, the, d the details that we've seen coming out, and we know that, as Scott has alluded to, that there are various concerns within um, conversion as to how it fits within the balancing of, of the interests of both tenants and landlords. We've noticed with interest the um, statement that's come in with regards to the assignation succession provisions within here and how they are deemed to be a fair balance between landlords and the tenants' uh, interests. Um, to be honest, we are a little baffled by that because if you're having the ability to convert to a fixed-term vehicle, and that has problems with the landlord's interest. We're not sure how, what, what effectively amounts to perpetual, perpetual tenancies being created and no chance of them ever coming to an end, no means coming to an end, how the landlord's interests are not being compromised and compromised quite severely within that. We've tried to understand it better with, with the Scottish Government civil servants, but we don't have an answer yet that we can understand. So we're looking to try and explore that further. Take that point. Um, I in order to wrap this up, is there any other final points, Dave? Just a final point. Y yes, I just want to uh, tease out one or two other things. Uh, uh, one or two? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's get them into one uh, question. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very interesting exchange, actually. Fascinating. And yeah. uh, it, it strikes me, if I've understood what's been said, that uh, uh, SLE, etc., basically have a, a fundamental objection to uh, secure tenancies uh, going on ad in infinitum. And a point was made about smaller ones in relation to the um, viable unit discussion that a, a smaller um, uh, farm would be a nice place for a house and a horse. It's a bit of a red herring, I think, convener. There are estates in my constituency where this is happening, where uh, whole estates are being purchased and uh, <laughs> are being turned into nice places for a house and a horse with current tenants being pushed off the estates. But I want to just extend it a little bit because uh, STFA in their evidence mentioned that there's been 120 secure tenancies lost uh, annually in recent years. Um, now, the landlords' representatives are saying that extending to these wider range of family uh, assignations uh, would really damage confidence Maybe what I'm going to say will damage confidence even more, because I wonder if we shouldn't actually be extending it even further um, and maybe adding a couple of categories. I mean, STFA have ar argued for open non-family assignations, totally open. But um, if we extended it to consider new entrants being able to have assignations of farms, and maybe one or two other uh, categories as well. Um, that could be dealt with, the detail of that could be dealt with uh, through regulation. And maybe people who are currently in limited partnerships, who are having their partnerships stopped, would also be eligible to have uh, such tenancies assigned to them. So with the existing proposals in the bill, with two or three additions that would 
allow new entrants and people who are going to lose their farms because of limited partnerships coming to an end, if these were added in to the list, um, would that not help us maintain tenancies? And otherwise, we're going to see a continuing loss of tenancies, secure tenancies, and they're going to disappear in time. So I wonder what panellists think about extending it to those maybe two or three other categories. Well, indeed, but in order to get it in perspective, we have to ask at the same time whether the grounds for objection to a new tenant you know, are adequate to much or too little in order to be able to in, see. In, indeed, yes. I mean, uh, that, that, that's, that's uh, been... Um, we've touched on that already, and, uh, but, yeah... That's fair enough, yeah. In terms of your question, let's see what yeah. answers we get. Yeah. OK, yeah. so Andrew Howard. Um, Mr Thompson's just picked, uh, touched on something which concerns me about um, the confidence issue and moving forward, which is that there seems to be um, a, a sort of lack of acceptance that any tenancy, whether it be of a... or agreement, in the case of limited partnerships, of a term can come to an end when the ten tenant doesn't want it to. Um, and if we, if we, well, but that seems to be the sorry, implication. Sorry, sorry. sorry. That, that, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just suggesting that there are people in limited partnerships who are having them come to an end. They might be quite good examples of people who should be allowed to bid for an assignation of a tenancy. All oh, right, OK, that's, that's uh, sorry. I, okay. I misinterpreted what was said, although I do think that there is that the point remains valid, that, uh, you know, I sense that there's a real issue going forward if we don't have an acceptance that f uh, any agreement for a fixed term can come to an end at that term date, because if we, if we don't sort of have an, a general acceptance about that, then in 10 or 15 years' time, we're all going to be back here because there's political pressure not to let those tenancies come to an end. And that will, that will impact on on the owners of properties um, desire to grant long-term agreements. They'll always try and keep the agreements within the remit of the, the next parliamentary or review cycle so that they minimise their, their apparent risk to political change. Can I just be clear, convener? I'm only talking about secure 91 tenancies and extending the list of people who can have them assigned. Yes, I misunderstood. Yeah. But that comes back down to the point that you cannot view the way 91 Act tenancies and the work you do in 91 Act tenancies separate from what is going to happen with the MLDTs going forward into the future. We, we accept the 91 Act tenancies are tenancies that continue generation to generation, and there's no problem with that. We're not seeking to bring those to an end. What we have here is a situation where there is no successor or there is no heir within that, and that gives a natural chance to restructure the, the business of the running the estate, amalgamate them with other farms, ensure that they're viable going forward into the future. What you're talking about is removing that entirely from the landlord's perspective to be able to do. So effectively, these tenancies would, inc would continue forever. And that sends out a very, very clear message that the terms of the tenancies you've entered into are being retrospectively altered by a third party to the benefit of the tenant side of it. Right. And, and that gives very little confidence going forward to using MLDTs or anything else. So... The public interest here, for me, is in a viable tenanted sector, and we've got to be careful that we don't, to the benefit of one, kill off the next bit. Can I just touch on yeah. one point uh, that, that you raised there, and I think Christopher Nicholson mentioned that you're talking about things being changed retrospectively. Yes. A lot of current 91 tenants, tenancies would go right back as far as 1948, potentially. So their tenancies were changed retrospectively to their detriment in terms of who they could be assigned to. So all we're doing now is looking back and maybe correcting a wrong that happened 40, 50 but years we ago. Have ones, uh, we have ones at home that were issued in 1994, I think. So they're not part of this retrospective you're talking about. So there's a whole swathe of them. How, do you dif how would you differentiate between those individual tenancies? Possibly go into the detail of that, but yeah. the point is well made, and I think it's understood by everybody here. With two more people wanted to comment on this, we want to try and complete this within the hour. We have about six more questions. Uh, Martin, uh, first of all, and then Scott, briefly. 
Thank you, Convener. I was just wanting to touch on the question that, that you were asking, actually, about the tests that were, um, could, could apply here. And one of our concerns is the, is the test that you only need to commence on a training course. And we just, it's almost a, the suggestion really needs to be about a professional farmer sort of test, which is, would address David Johnson's point, I think, of a, of a lifestyle person with horses in the, in the field. So it, it's, it's, I think, asking you to look at that, that element of it again. Thank you for that, Scott Walker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I think the committee's got a feeling of some of the polarised views that, that can be expressed on, on, on this subject. But I think it's, it's worthwhile just dealing with some of the points of consensus, where I do think there is a general consensus within, within the industry on. Um, I think people want the situation sorted out, where if people die out of turn, you know, they're not, a, not a allowed to succeed to the tenancy. You know, I think, generally speaking, most people say, let's try and sort, sort that, that situation out. And another situation where I think there is a consensus is, again, where there is an existing family member who's actively farming on the farm just now, but isn't entitled to succeed. People do feel that, again, that's maybe a surgical type of, type of area that, that can, can be dealt with. So I think there is some consensus, you know, even amongst the huge, strong, polarised views here. So I would hope as the bill, bill progresses, certainly those points are captured and are, are, are dealt with and sorted out. I'm going to go on to compensation for tenants' improvements. Uh, Christian Allard, your question, please. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, first of all, it's regarding the, um, the period um, of two years, uh, an, an amnesty uh, period of two years. And I know that the amnesty principle is agreed by everybody around the table. Uh, but uh, the NFU Scotland came on and we written evidence giving us an indication that there uh, may be a period of two or three years. And we know that the holding reviews did propose three years to coincide with the three-year rent cycle. And if you Scotland is telling us that um, uh, the idea behind being only two years might be uh, to make sure that uh, improvement dispute uh, could be settled uh, within uh, the three years period. So I would like to have your views on that. What would you like the bill to be? Would it be inside two years? And uh, the period would be two years to give a year uh, for settlement or should uh, the period should be three years, as indicated by the review group? Christopher Nicholson. Um, like NFUS, we, we, we believe that it should be three years, which matches the rent review cycle. Um, the main reason being that um, it, it will, it's going to be quite a, a big um, effort to get, ensure that all tenants in the country are aware of this amnesty and provisions in the bill. And for many tenants, the only time they get in touch with professional advisors um, about tenancies is during a rent review. So we feel that if you extend it to three years, there's a greater chance that everyone will find out about the measures in the bill. From an SD point of view, I can see the logic in having a three-year window to match the rent review cycle. I know we proposed originally, I think, a one-year amnesty when we proposed the amnesty itself. But... For sake of agreement, I think three years is perfectly reasonable. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which is from Jim Hume. Uh, that sort of line of question regarding Wago, um, it's, it has been argued that Wago can be a, a, a disincentive for, for a tenant farmer to retire, and of course if a tenant farmer retires, that gives a new entrant at, le at least a chance uh, to uh, enter into the, the farming world. So just wondering on the panel's view regarding the, the, the thoughts from uh, some sectors that uh, WIGO should be agreed perhaps before the tenant uh, gives his notice to quit. Yeah, WIGO is hugely important for the tenant. You know, it's, it's, it's a reflection of the work investment they've done in, in the business. And you know, a way to view it also is, is probably their pension you know, for, 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 for their life, lifestyle afterwards. And it's also one of these situations where people don't have individual experience on. They, they possibly only negotiate WIGO once in, in their life, lifetime. 
Um, so what, what we think would be helpful would be a two-stage process. So whereas, and this, to be honest, while we talk about two-stage process, this often is actually best practice, which operates in some situations just, just now. And we're looking just to formalise this, this best practice. So it would be the, the tenant would be able to indicate to the landlord that he wishes to you know, discuss Wagle. Um, he, he indicates that he may wish to give up the tenancy. But that allows them to, you know, sort out any disputes that may happen to Wago, also to agree what the Wago uh, figure figure should be. And if an agreement is reached there, then the tenant then would serve his notice to, to quit. And on that basis, the sum of money that had been agreed or discussed at Wago would then be ratified and, and filed through. Because we do, we generally get the feeling back from from members just now that to serve your notice to quit where you've not actually agreed or understood what WACO is, you're, you're giving up a strong negotiating position and you're almost entering in, into the unknown. So to, to give that sort of two-stage process, we think would be helpful for, for all mm -hmm. parties. Good. Yeah. Okay. Can I go back to Christian Allard then for a second yes, point? Yes, uh, and on the uh, submission from the Royal Institute of Shattered Surveyors, uh, did suggest that we should be a period of... 30 years, there should be a backstop for a claim for compensation, uh, and we suggested 30 years for it. And we give the um, suggestion as a, as a reason for it that some improvement uh, could be uh, written off. Uh, I'm not quite sure if anybody wants to comment on that. Will all improvement will be written off after 30 years, and is there a, re a good reason to have a, uh, a backstop for a claim? Rex, sorry, Niall. The reasoning behind that, I think, is really to recognise the fact that some improvements that will have been made many, many decades ago, you know, will have potentially exceeded their e e economic life, and there's a question, you know, about the worth that they then bring. When it comes to the question of value of improvements, age is not relevant. It's the value of those improvements at Wago. Some improvements are permanent, for example, the removal of obstacles to cultivation and some land improve, other land improvements, and they should, be, they should not be excluded from the amnesty simply because they're more than 30 years old. Um, even modern farm buildings have a life expectancy of over 70 years, so they should not be excluded simply because they're over halfway through their life expectancy. I agree that there will be some improvements incoming tenant but the amnesty is not about the valuation the amnesty is about establishing which improvements are eligible so some of those improvements may be eligible but if they've got no um, capital value at the end of the lease or, or no value to an incoming tenant then there won't be any compensation paid for them um, to pick up on the two points the first one is uh, the one that Scott made about uh, having to issue the notice to quit first before you end up entering the negotiation for the way going. I think it's uh, very sensible what um, Scott proposes in that to have a discussion about the way goings ahead of serving that notice uh, would be helpful and it would put lesser burden on the tenants. So that seems to be practical and reasonable. Um, the other thing about the way goings is that the way goings itself seems to me to be at the very heart of a lot of these concerns that exist between the landlord and the tenant. And if we are able to sort out the issues that surround way goings, and getting fair, fair way goings, then a lot of these issues surrounding succession, assignation, conversion, the driver for that is, is less critical. So I personally uh, agree entirely with Chris on the point of view that the amnesty is here to list all the improvements. It's not to value the improvements in any shape or form. Um, but I personally don't think there should be a time limit of 30 years on it. I think that the value is what the value is to the incoming tenant. And it may be that it has no value. It maybe it has quite a lot of value and it's beyond 30 years. But that's got to be done on an individual basis and a case, case by case basis. Chairman Hume. Agreement on both those points that Christian Allard and I were seeking out, so that's good. Um, STFA in their submission were talking about the list of improvements that are eligible for compensation and that these need to be brought up to date, as in their view that was uh, drafted in the 1940s. Uh, obviously, that would be interesting to see if others think that the uh, the improvements eligible for compensation should also be brought up to date. And 
I think the government's in the process of trying to, to work this out at the moment. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. anachronisms in there which definitely need updated. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, let's move on to the improvements by the landlord. Uh, Alec Ferguson. I think this probably needs up to take a huge amount of time, but um, in, in specific terms of, of improvements made by the landowner, as I'm sure everybody's aware, Section 96 inserts a new Section 91 Act, which would require landlords to give notice tenants of those certain improvements, give the tenant a right to object, and refer any disputes to the Land Court. And I just wonder how any panel members who have a comment to make on that, what they feel about it. There's a huge outbreak of consensus here, Convener, which is, which is very, very welcome. Uh, resolving disputes, Sarah Boyack. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, the issue of resolving disputes is really important and clarity on different processes um, and when you would want to engage the land court is really important. So the bill extends the role of the land court um, in resolving disputes arising from the amnesty and improvements and deciding on applications from the tenant for an enforced sale and in ruling where a tenant is objected to a proposed improvement by a landlord. It would still have a role in rent review disputes using the revised rules for calculating rent. And I just want to test out some of the written evidence we've had from Sava and Rex um, who claim that it's not a suitable forum for rent review disputes and that a rent assessment panel or an arbitration process would be more important. So I want you to I want to tease out some of those comments. Go first. Um, I, I don't think we're seeing taking the land court away altogether, but we're seeing that there is a more, pro, a more appropriate and proportional way of di resolving a lot of these disputes before they get to the land court, and that should be given a, a higher priority and given particularly under the Arbitration 2010 Act, uh, which the Scottish Government are promoting quite heavily and, and, and key to the sort of policy, that, that that should be brought into the agricultural uh, tenancy world. Um, so we're not, we're not suggesting taking the land court away, but we're saying let's bring, you know, arbitration is there, it's available, let's, let's um, um, make the Arbitration Act um, fit agricultural circumstances. And other media, uh, you know, mediation or, or expert determination as well, but that, that would um, resolve a lot of uh, angst within the sector. It's the dispute resolution which is causing, you know, having to, to revert, re refer and revert to the land court for, uh, uh, to resolve a lot of these disputes. It's, it's causing a lot of problems. Yeah, I think we've got a sense of that from our previous discussions on agricultural holdings because going to the land court is very lengthy as a process. It's also time consuming. Um, it is also very expensive for people to actually go and um, once you get into that position, it's presumably also incredibly confrontational and very difficult to pull back. So I think that idea about arbitration is important. How would you actually ensure that it is included in the process so that people have access to arbitration? Because it's possible that if one side doesn't want to go to arbitration, nothing happens, and that's effectively a way to veto anything happening. Well, there are a couple of, of ways to do that. One is by making it so that it can go to arbitration by referral by one of the parties, which would avoid the need to um, um, be a, an agreement between the parties to go to arbitration, I suppose. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, and, sorry, I've lost my thread of thought. Um, but I was going to come on to mediation because I think mediation is, has been underplayed, particularly in the agricultural sector, and I think there's a greater role to be played to avoid that confrontation and to try and encourage parties to come to agreement between themselves by um, uh, a refer. Perhaps, perhaps it's the, the commissioner's job to um, bring in a mediator to resolve the dispute, uh, but there's certainly, uh, or perhaps the land court to. to not to entertain cases that haven't had um, been to another forum first before they, before they get there. There's a whole raft of, of possibilities within that that would, would um, take away a lot of the angst. Yeah, so you see the land court as a last resort. Absolutely. Rather than the first port of call. Definitely, yeah. Um, and I suppose having the Tenant Farming Commission involved in that process would be what's reasonable, how long would people have to wait to go to mediation or arbitration, because uh, that would be one way to drag out a dispute. I, I think that would be quite By just important. not resolving it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. I was wondering, with regards to trying to encourage people, I mean, we, we, we think the land court should be the, the backstop 
for, for these disputes, should it has to go that far, but we thoroughly support the idea of mediation and arbitration before that. And I wonder if it's something simple along the lines that um, if you did end up going to land court, when it comes to awarding things like costs for who's responsible for the dispute, if you hadn't gone through the process of arbitration and mediation, that forms a factor in awarding of the costs, and it may come account against you if you don't take part in mediation and arbitration. Yeah, I think that's yep. fair. Uh, uh, Christopher Nicholson. Just a, a, a quick observation. The, the land court may well be an appropriate place to go for a, a question that is a point of law, um, but many of the disputes that end up in the land court are to do are disputes over valuations, which is really the role of a, an, a, an expert valuer. So it would make sense to try and, through mediation or expert determination or arbitration, to ensure that those questions uh, attempt to be addressed before the land court stage. I think we've, we, we've got a general agreement on that, on that point. OK, um, thinking about the uh, human rights aspects of uh, the bill, uh, obviously there are issues which have been raised already by people about the proposal for the conversion of 1991 tenancies, which might affect both parties, uh, the widening of uh, the, the successors and assignee categories, which could also uh, alter that balance. Um, part 10 seeks to strike a fair and proportionate balance between the rights of the landlord and tenant. Uh, and the government is attempting to try and, uh, you know, uh, consider how uh, this this law work in the light of case law, etc. Um, I'm concerned, you know, that uh, we need to have some kind of uh, view from you about the relative impact of these proposals in the round on the rights of both parties. Uh, in the light of our discussions earlier, do you see? Uh, the proposals that we're come or before us as being proportionate. Christopher Nicholson. And the, the, the review group has a, attempted to address the balance between um, tenants' property rights and, and la landlords' property rights. Um, I think at the stage we are at the moment, there's um, a lot of uncertainty over the legal implications of of human rights, and human rights is the frame, framework to give the, give the balance. Um, certainly for, for t tenants, bearing in mind the changing nature of tenancies, that, that the tenants themselves are putting more and more um, fixed capital into holdings, I don't think the um, balance, I don't think that the, the, the the bill as it stands goes far enough to address that balance and um, ECHR implications have, uh, have caused a great deal of um, caution and, and concern um, and it's, it's certainly overshadowed the whole, the whole pro process. Right, Andrew Howard, then David Johnson. Um, I think I should qualify this by saying I'm in no way an ECHR um, expert. The, looking at the two main provisions that could potentially um, engage um, ECHR, it, it seems to me, and looking at it from our business's point of view, that conversion, if the balance was right, um, could find or deliver a proportionate response to the policy objective, which is to encourage retirement and perhaps allow greater flexibility in the system. You could see that um, the outgoing tenant would feel that something had been obtained. It might introduce an opportunity for an incoming um, tenant, and the landlord may feel that um, their circumstances in some cases, where, for instance, they thought they'd got a line of succession ahead of them, um, was also improved because they'd now got a fixed-term um, tenancy. So, that looks as if you might find balance looking at it as a layman. I find it more difficult to see how that balance is going to be um, found in the provisions as they're stated for assignation and succession, 
but also in ideas that have been um, raised here today about open assignation of 1991 Act tenancies, where effectively the owner of the property is deprived of all real legitimate expectation of having the property back at any point. They've effectively had that property placed permanently in the secure tenancy sector, no hope of getting it back. I'm not clear what the um, public policy objective is in doing that, and I'm not clear that um, even for some of the uh, sort of suggestions that have been made today that there aren't more proportional responses that could be, um, uh, could be adopted. So to use an example for assignation and succession, um, one of the things you could do is you could target um, the provisions at the people that are actually affected. So that might be those non-near relative successors who are actively engaged in the business and would suffer hardship if they couldn't um, do that. But I'm not quite sure that I understood, understand the public interest in that tenant being able to assign that to a heart surgeon niece who lives in, in London. I, I don't feel that that um, is a proportionate response to the stated objective. So I think that's at risk. Okay. Uh, David Johnson. Thank you, um, I mean, Andrew's very eloquently laid out for pretty much what I was going to say. Um, I think there are some sections in the bill which have struck that fair balance between landlords and, and tenants' rights, and that's things like um, where the landlord's in breach of his obligations. There's, there's plenty of safeguards in there for the landlord to rectify the position to give him a chance to make it right before the draconian measure of losing the property is brought into place. Um, conversion is the next step on from that, if you like. Again, if it's on a measured length of term, then it has the possibility of, or the probability of, of doing what's required in the public interest argument and allowing the churn people to retire with dignity and move on. And the, the landlords themselves do benefit from the point of view that a, a perpetual tenancy is now turned into a fixed term tenancy, uh, albeit we don't know the duration of the term. Succession assignation is, and also the, some of the thoughts we've, 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 further thoughts we've heard, is basically creating the perpetual tenancy. And from the way we see it, you're asking them from the landlord's position to take a disproportionate uh, burden for the delivery of the public policy, as Andrew suggests, which I'm not entirely too sure what it's trying to achieve by doing this. And so we don't believe there is a fair balance struck within that particular measure within the bill. And um, it looks like it would be struggling to be compatible under the ECHR. Okay. Um, does the Law Society have a view about uh, these discussions? Yeah. Uh, what has just been said, uh, that that's the one that sticks out particularly in this bill, uh, the, 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 the landlords um, might have uh, a claim, um, and it, as it stands at the moment, probably would have a claim in these circumstances. But your own advisers will be able to get a better handle on it. OK, I'm going to put this another way around. There are always political, economic and social issues to be taken into account. And in a democratic society, uh, the mandate of a government and the support that it gains within this parliament could be said to be the public interest. And uh, if the public interest, as expressed by the mandate for the government, is to make changes that actually are going to rebalance rights, um, can we see a means whereby an ECHR that uh, Europe sees that as the wish of this particular nation, uh, as trumping any particular uh, issues related to the landlord versus the tenant in this case? It is for this parliament to judge whether any bill going through the process is going to give rise to these issues. And there's always, at the back of the bill, a note as to the presumed outcome. If you change um, the text of this, as it will be changed, it developed before it becomes an act, that process continues. But it's not for me, it's for your own advisers in this parliament to tell you where you're getting too close to the wind 
it's a, con it's a c continual process uh, and not just one snapshot. The issue can fall in and out, even with just two sentences. Johnson and then Scott Walker. Um, I mean, I caveat this to say that I'm no expert in this, but my understanding of it is, is, is there's two real aspects within this. There's one is, is the public interest argument that you're making um, to try and uh, do what you wish to do within the public interest, which comes down to your government elected um, mandate from the people. But there's also then within that the recognition that if you decide to do something that has an impact and a material impact upon one section of society, then that has to be recognised in carrying out that public interest argument. And as we see it on, on the bill and the face of the bill, especially with succession assignation, there doesn't appear to be any recognition in there at all that the landlords are taking a burden with regards to that change. Okay, uh, and Scott Walker. Of the ECHR has certainly clouded some of the discussions that we can have with our members over certain aspects of, of, the, of the bill, because in, in a layman's term, you know, we'd be looking at going back to your principles right at the very, very beginning. Would this measure generate greater investment? Would this measure encourage new entrants into the industry? Would this measure you know, um, make, make the businesses more, more viable? And also from NFUS's particular perspective, is it going to increase food production you know, on, on the land, which, which is an issue for us, you know, key, key for us. So certainly clarity on um, the parameters that could be discussed uh, in these issues would be helpful for the industry to take place in, in discussion. And I think ultimately at the end of, end of this whole, whole, whole process, uh, what we'd like to see or what we'd like to avoid is um, legal disputes you know, that, that arise where individuals want to challenge this bill and ultimately the courts will decide what's right, right or wrong. Because the more legal disputes or legal opportunities that arise at the end of this process, the more damaging that will be to confidence and the more damaging that will be to actually get what we believe is one of the key objectives, encouraging people to let land and increasing the amount of, of let, let land there. When it comes to ECHR, I've sat down with lawyers. I'm more confused than ever whenever I, whenever I meet them. So, lay, you know, layman's issues to be put out so the industry could discuss this would be very, very helpful. Obviously, uh, Europe looks at proportionality and uh, fair balance in the decisions that are taken and so on. The question is whether these fair balances are something which uh, fits... Uh, whose ever uh, legal advice uh, suggests that ECHR is affected or not. Now, I'm not going to try and open up into a wide range of discussion about uh, the law, but I'm raising these points because they are germane to what we're talking about just now. Christopher Nicholson. Um, the, the discussion about the measures that focus um, this, um, at, at ECHR attention so far have been measures that not all stakeholders have, have consensus on. But there are some significant measures that were put forward by the review group that had the consensus of all stakeholders, as far as I know, that have been prevented from appearing in the bill due to ECHR. And one in particular it is concerns the amnesty, whereby um, the, the amnesty was intended to allow compensation for any improvements that were appropriate for the holding. However... The, the measures in the bill su su suggest that that's not possible where a landlord has objected to an improvement, even though that improvement may be appropriate to the holding. Our suggestion is that in those situations where a landlord has objected to an um, improvement, um, it should go through the same test that the land court would apply, which is, is that improvement appropriate to the holding? But seemingly, due to the restrictions of ECHR, that's not not, not possible, and it's, it's quite a big hole that in the, in the amnesty. Just picking up that point very briefly, I mean, that seems curious. I wasn't aware that the reason that that had been removed was for BCHR reasons, but um, as Scott said, that 
you ask two or three ECHR lawyers and you'll get three different um, opinions. Um, I mean, I think what's, what, what's necessary is a clear statement of the, object of the objectives and then a proportional response, i.e. a response to that policy objective that, um, or you use the least um, impactful, um, that's the wrong word, but I think you know what I mean, policy response to the objective um, in hand. And I think what concerns me about assignation and succession um, as I've said already, is that the objective seems um, somewhat confused and there may well be other ways of doing this. In fact, there almost certainly are other ways of doing this that have less impact on a certain class of property rights um, within Scotland and which would still achieve um, the policy objective. David Johnson? No, that was coming on the Right, OK, mm. fine, thank you. Um, I think we want to go to a catch-all situation now. Uh, or did you have a... Right, very briefly, please. We've, we've still got 20 minutes, I can... No, we haven't. We've got right. as much time as I decide, <laughs> and I'm yeah. deciding at the moment that we're going to have a very short bit here because we want to ask a Indeed. final question. Um, you did say one o'clock earlier, but never mind. Um, just on the point of, you know, the impact on a certain class of owners, it depends how far back you want to go. You can go back to 1948, 1886. Some landlords will go back much further. You can go right back to the start, to Adam, you know, when God gave the earth to all of us. So it's all, it's all relative. But what, uh, where I struggle in terms of ECHR is to understand why... Uh, continuing tenancies, even perpetual ones, would put any sort of burden on a landlord, given that they are getting rent for it. it. It's only a burden if they want to get rid of tenants and do something different. But we've got to look at the rights of everyone here, and we've got to look at the common good. And as I say, you know, land isn't something you can create any more of. It's a fundamental thing that's given to us all. And that is what has to be the overriding factor at the end of the day, I think. Point is well made. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to follow up the point that was made by the STFA there about significant measures which had the support of all the stakeholders but haven't appeared in the face of the bill. Um, is the amnesty issue the only one? Or are there other issues where um, the Agriculture Holdings Review Report did come up with measures that was broad agreement on but are not in the bill that you think should have been? Um, the, the, there are quite a few measures um, amongst, well, quite a few recommendations of the review group that have not made it into the bill. I don't know whether the intention is to bring, bring them forward yes. at stage two or, or in, a, in another parliament, but a key, a key, another key one is the 35-year the repairing lease, which we saw as a, quite an important recommendation to the benefit of new entrants, which is, is not in the, in the bill. Catch all things that we can pick up. No, I'm just asking, asking the question because I'd, I'd seen one or two comments by different um, submissions about concerns that things might be added later, which changes the balance. And it was particularly to pull in where we've got general agreement, it, just to flush those things out so that we've got clarity on it when we get to the stage one debate. I think we've got there uh, on the evidence that we've received, you know, but where there are agreements and where there are still disagreements, which are quite clear in the, the official report. Yeah. Graham Day. Uh, yeah, can you maybe just to wrap things up, if, if, if that's appropriate? I think in the nature of these sessions, the members kind of raise questions in areas of the bill that they think are appropriate. I just wonder, looking around the witnesses, is there anything in the bill that we haven't touched upon today that you think is quite significant or you feel you have a significant point to make on? So to give you that opportunity. Christopher Nicholson. Um, one um, key part of uh, element of, of WAGO, which we think um, is, is missing in the bill, is the, n not only the, the, the proposal for a two-stage WAGO process that's been discussed today, but also the way improvements are valued at the moment. At the moment, the value is to incoming tenant, and that's in terms of the increase in productivity resulting from that improvement. However, in this day and age, there are all sorts of improvements that tenants make that are required for farming and, and modern living standards, etc., that do not result in an increase in 
productivity of the farm. For, for, so, for example, um, modern standards of housing do not result in increase in productivity. Um, improvements in, in terms of uh, amenity value, for example, the planting of hedges and other environmental improvements do not result in increased productivity of the holding in agricultural terms. Um, and also improvements to do with um, animal welfare and health and safety and working environment. These improvements do not necessarily result in an increase in productivity of the holding, but nonetheless should be eligible for compensation if the improvements result in an increase in capital value of the holding. So, for example, a farm with head, good hedges is worth more, possibly due to amenity value, than a, a farm without hedges. And, and if those hedges were put there by the tenant, they should be eligible for compensation. And that requires a change in the way um, improvements are valued at Wago. Mm -hmm. And to Howard. Um, I understand what um, Chris is getting at. I think a number of the examples that were listed would probably get included in any valuation at Wago as you as we currently stand, because um, a better house or meeting modern animal welfare standards, etc., would improve the farmability and the productive um, uh, ability of the farm. So I'd be surprised if they didn't get um, picked up. I, I think it raises a difficult question, though, if you're going to start to try and compensate for things that no occupier of the farm, whether it be the owner or a future tenant, can derive any value from, for instance, a hedge. Um, unless that hedge is replacing fencing, which would make perhaps the, um, the sort of husbandry element cheaper. Um, that would be difficult to deal with. I think that the, the measure of the value to an incoming tenant seems by far, far the most appropriate, even if there are a couple of difficulties around the edge, because it reflects what the future occupier of the farm can do with it. Yes. Christopher Nicholson. If... I, we're not saying that any, any improvement should be eligible f for, for a, a valuation. Um, what, what we're saying is that improvements, it shouldn't be restricted to improvements that um, add value for the incoming tenant. Um, we should also include improvements that add capital value to the holding. Potential that the tenant would have received cap money to put the hedges in. In some cases, yes, but we, we already have methods of dealing with support payments. Okay. A, a lot of improvements will have received um, government support, okay. and uh, this, uh, that's not a new issue to resolve. Okay. Right. I, I think that's all has been uh, answered as far as I'm concerned at the moment. If anyone has any points that they need to make, they can follow up in writing with us uh, at this point. I think I want to thank all our witnesses for what has been a thorough session. Uh, which is part of a wider process. We've had a lot of written uh, evidence as well, and it's very helpful to have your views on the day about these things. And uh, I would like to conclude this section of uh, the meeting. We're going to move on to some uh, further public business straight away, because as well as that, we have a private section before one o'clock. Thank you all. So agenda item two. You get your point up in Cambridge for yeah. several hours. Yeah. yeah. No, but I can't make it. Driving. No, but I can't make it. Yeah. Right. Sorry, sorry. That's okay, but that's fine. I'll explain it. Yes. Right, we're going to move on to agenda item two. Thank you. The second item today is uh, for the two negative instruments. Can we move on to agenda item two, please? Can the members please pay attention to the business just now? And can the panel please remove itself? Uh, we'll hear from you later, no doubt, if there are points to be raised. So we have uh, two negative instruments. One, the South Arran Marine Conservation Order of 2014, the Urgent Continuation Order 2015, and the Wester Ross uh, Marine Conservation Order of 2015. And I refer members to the papers and ask if there are any comments that they wish to make. First of all, on South Arran. And then on uh, Wester Ross. 
Yep. Just a list of us. Can you know, just to note how deeply disappointing it was that the government had to t uh, step in and take this action? Which is something I think we should need to explore a bit further, perhaps, uh, to find out why, mm -hmm. uh, because we can ask the government a little bit more about that. But I understand it's because of dredging that took place uh, on a site which is designated for an MPA and that they had to take urgent action to do so. It would be interesting to see if that happens in other places as well. Uh, Sarah Boyack. Convener, um, I just wanted to say I think we should be um, welcoming the fact that these bits of secondary legislation are going to be put in place in terms of protect our marine environment. As you say, and as Graeme Days mentioned, uh, there are concerns about dredging and there are the, the idea of having to bring a continuation order to protect the area. I think we should make sure that these go through uh, the Parliament with good speed and are get, get placed in as soon as is appropriate. Well, it sounds to me as though uh, there's nobody who's objecting to that. So I ask the committee, are we agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Yes. We're agreed. Thank you very much. Well, at the next meeting of the committee on the 23rd of September, we'll be considering one negative instrument and uh, possibly based on the earlier discussions, taking evidence of agricultural holdings remedial order uh, with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment. We'll also take evidence from stakeholders on marine protected areas, uh, which may begin to answer some of the questions we've just raised. Uh, as previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session to discuss evidence heard on the Land Reform Scotland Bill. And I now close the public part of the meeting and ask for anyone left in the public gallery to go. Thank you very much. Right, we've uh, heard a lot.